Come on. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. Okay. We have a public hearing. Mm -hmm. I, should, I should maybe read this. Okay. Okay, we are ready. I'd like to call the Wednesday, February 17th, 2016 meeting of the Denver Regional Council of Governments to order. If we'd all please rise and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Eva Henry? Here. Bill Hollen? Nancy Sharp? Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Tim Mock? Tom Hayden? Here. Chrissy Fanganello? Here. Robin Kneech? Kevin Flynn? Roger Partridge? Here. Gail Watson? Don Rozier? Present. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Jim Peters? Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Han Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. George Teal, Paul Donahue, Kathy Noon, Here. Ron Angles, Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Here. Gail Christie, Richard Champion, Here. Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Carl Randolph, Steve Conklin. Here. Joe Jefferson. Here. Dan Woog. Mark Gruber. Daniel Dick. Present. George Heath. Samantha Meering. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Henry Ergot. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Paula Bovo. Doris Rigoni. Sosha Karis Graves. Casey Brown. Ron Rakowski. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek, Present. Jackie Millay, Here. John Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. John O'Brien, Connie Sullivan, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, Kyle Mollica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozel, Here. Adam Mikowski, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce Jay, Here. Gary Sanford, Here. Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter, Here. we do have a quorum. We have a quorum, so we are going to start with the report of the chair. Um, RTC did not meet yesterday. Uh, that meeting was canceled. However, we, a special meeting was held to take action on the Longmont TIP amendment that we discussed at our meeting uh, last month. I want to let you know that the amendment was approved by um, the RTC in that special meeting. Uh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. May I have a May I have a motion to approve the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? You know, leave it to my last meeting to forget something. Um, actually, I probably have gotten that before. So, back to, back to me. No. Uh, all right. Elise is going to be walking us through, Elise and, and Bob Pfeiffer actually are going to be walking us through some of the items reporting back on the structure and governance group. So I'm not going to belabor that with you tonight. But I do want to let you know that really the focus of the changes from, that are being proposed are really to improve the efficiency of this organization and kind of respond to the dynamics of who we are today as a board. Um, and in particular, really the budget and uh, the administration of this organization and opportunities for board members to really move up into leadership positions within the organization. Uh, they are, I think, 
uniformly endorsed by members of the structures and governance. And if I could ask all of you part that have participated in that group to please raise your hand again. I'd like to you to acknowledge the good work of these um, board, mem board members. So thank you. Uh, I, uh, along with Jennifer Scheffel, our lobbyist Mickey Farrell, and Jayla Sanchez-Warren went to DC. We celebrated the Super Bowl victory in a pub in Washington that had a lot of Carolina fans. And uh, we were there in our orange representing, but I, I'm going to um, say it was not quite the crowd, the hometown crowd that we would have liked to have been, but it was wonderful to be there and I think we actually got some good work accomplished on behalf of this organization. I want you guys to know that the lady to my left is considered quite a celebrity at the National Association of Regional Councils. And I kid you not when I say that, and I know it sounds a little flippant, but it's not true. This organization is so well respected nationally as a body. The other executive directors could not wait to come running up to Jennifer. And I was like, well, I'm the chair. They're like, out of my way. <laughs> Let me approach the, the queen. And, and I think it speaks well to all of us here, quite honestly, the work we do here. They're very curious about what's happening at Dr. Cog. They want to know what we are doing. We are really seen as a leader. And I think that really is important and should be of note. Um, on to the bad news. The other thing we did while we were back there is meet with uh, some of the Colorado delegation and some of the House staff members that are going to be on the committee that's going to be hearing the Older Americans Act. Jayla could speak to you much more passionately about this. I'm going to cut to the bottom line. We are one of 24 states that are negatively impacted by the bill that came out of the Senate. Uh, funding is not following the seniors. There is a hold harmless provision that keeps the funding with states that historically have received funding based on an old census data that have on their population of seniors. This is a huge issue for us. Um, we do not have the money to support the senior population in this region. We have a waiting list of over six weeks for Meals on Wheels. Um, rides to the doctors are even longer than that. Um, and the AARP, I will call them out here, <laughs> nationally, is supporting this legislation, which is fundamentally unfair to not just Colorado seniors, but uh, seniors in 23 states and one territory. Um, they, know, they know it's not fair. We're going to pass this, this map around. This was distributed at, um, at the conference, and then it was presented to our delegation that we met with and to the staff on the ranking committee that's going to be hearing this. It, um, in my mind, is appalling that a national organization that we all pay money into uh, is supporting legislation that is fundamentally unfair to seniors. So uh, we are working hard to correct that, but I think the more we can get that message out in this community to our legislators, and, and Jennifer and the staff are actually working to communicate this information to the other area agencies on aging that um, throughout the country and the other COGS throughout the country to let them know if you are in one of these red states, you are harmed by the bill that came out of the Senate. If you're yellow, you stay neutral, and if you're green, you're, ben you're, you're benefiting from the hold harmless provision. I mean, our goal would be actually to have adequate funding for all of the states to make everything turn green, but if you're not going to do that, at least don't be hurting seniors in our community. So I know Phil wants to make a comment. Phil, I'm going to wrap, and then I will absolutely let you. Oh, okay, go ahead, Phil. I won't take long. It's one of those things where the, what the hold harmless does is it says you don't get anything less than what you got before. And just to so, show how the distortion occurs, uh, if you look at one of the green states, you have the state of Pennsylvania there. Their over age 60 population over the last uh, 10 years grew at about 3 percent. So, you know, you had Ohio and they had uh, an older population that grew and, and that was there. But they're, they're one of the green states and so they were not receiving anything less. We're not saying that the money's adequate for everyone, but uh, if you take a look at Colorado, same 10 year period, over age 60 population in Colorado grew at 30%. And so th if the allocation says no one with 
what they're receiving is going to receive any less, and your pool of dollars is essentially the same purchasing power, and if you allocate it and you say no one's going to get hurt, what it does is it distorts the distribution that occurs there. And so uh, we're one of the red states. All the red states are basically at, this, at the same point. All the green states had grow, s slower growth in the population over 60, and those in the yellow states basically had the balance. Okay, thank you. Moving on, um, yes, sir. So has it been heard in the House yet? No, it is not, and that's why we're meeting with, the, with not only our representatives, but the, the staff on the committee that is going to be the chairman of the committee and the ranking member of the committee. So we're trying to get the message out, but um, it, it was very discouraging to hear the comments. They seem to be willing to accept this fundamental unfairness. So I think the more they can hear from folks, the better. And I'm going to have Jennifer expand on, on that. And, but did you have a comment on that, yes, sir? Yes, so, and what committee and what key representatives actually will be in D.C. next week, so be happy to try to reach out. Oh, great. So maybe we can talk afterwards to get more information. That would be great. And if any of you are going to be in D.C. and want that information, I think maybe it makes sense to actually have it sent out from the executive director to all of us so we can spread the word when we're there. And we're happy to do that. Um, it hasn't been heard in the House yet, and uh, but I will tell you that uh, with uh, we were just uh, really excited to get complete bipartisan um, uh, support from the Colorado uh, members of the House. They all signed on to a letter to the chair and co-chair of the of the subcommittee saying. This is bad for Colorado. Colorado is hurt more than any other state in the nation. And if you look at the, Jackie said it's 24 states and territories, it represents 62% of the seniors in this nation, those red states. So it is clearly unfair. It's just not about the number of states. It's about the number of seniors that are potentially impacted. And Jackie's right, too. AARP, the, in my view, the largest advocate for seniors is saying what the Senate has done is okay let's just let's just get a bill passed regardless of of the damage that it's doing so uh, but anyone who's going will be I'm happy to get information to you in fact we're putting together a nice package that we'll be sending out to my counterparts um, uh, cogs around the nation and Jayla will be sending out to her counterparts other triple A's in the nation to be sure that that the word gets out there because I don't think that people really understand uh, what this what this means Thank you. It's a very serious issue that is going to become an even greater issue for this community and the, the economy of this state, quite honestly. So uh, now for the last time I get to do one of the fun things I really enjoy most as the chair is welcoming some new folks to the table. Uh, we, I have a list of new member, excuse me, actually it's, tonight it's all just alternates. Um, and if you're here, I'm not aware of any of the new alternates being here. I'm going to introduce an alternate who is here for the first time. But Rex Bell, the alternate from Brighton. Nope. Carrie Penaloza, the alternate from Centennial. Is Carrie? Nope. Okay. John Hamlin, the alternate from Federal Heights. Stephanie Walton, alternate from Lafayette. Well, I do know this person is here, Dana Gutwine from Lakewood. Dana, if you could just stand up and let us say hello and welcome you as the alternate from Lakewood. Thanks for being here tonight. Okay, so now it's the last report of the chair, so I've got to say my goodbyes. I will still be sitting at the table, but I will not be sitting here next month. And I just want to share with you that the, um, I've been involved in local government for, for 12 years, um, the last eight years as a council member. And, um, and I hope to be the mayor, but we'll see if that, about my election in May. But I'm going to tell you, uh, looking back on my tenure with public service, I will honestly say the time I've spent chairing this organization, I actually will cherish. It, uh, it has been a uh, challenging 20 months for me, but really inspiring. And I've made some good friends sitting at this table. I've had some good debates with folks at this table. Um, but I, I really am very proud of this organization. And, and quite honestly, the more time I have spent um, learning about other councils of government and MPOs in this country, the more I've come to appreciate this organization. Uh, I chaired through some challenging periods with SCI, but that also gave me an opportunity to go out and, and meet other communities that are really 
dealing with some of the same issues and challenges that we're dealing with here. Um, going back to DC, this is the second time I've participated in the National Association of Regional Councils. And, I, and it is no joke when I tell you that we are really seen as a model in this country. And um, the fact that we got through a tip cycle and we all were smiling and actually laughing at the end of it, it, it you know, that says something. The fact that we come together, um, not always 56 of us, but the majority of that are here at least once a month, soon to be twice a month. Um, I have to applaud all of you and I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to have been here and serving with you. So thank you for that. And I look forward to passing this over to uh, Elise Jones, our county commissioner from Boulder. And while I was in D.C., uh, Jennifer and I were in the, um, in the gift shop at the, uh, <laughs> in, the, in one of the congressional buildings. And, I, and we, were, I, we were looking through George Washington's rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. And I couldn't think of a better gift to give her as the incoming chair as a book of reference than this. So Elise to you, and I look forward to, to sitting, <laughs> sitting with you. And, and then before I'll, I'll you see, and then my last, my last official act that I'm totally taking credit for, but it was not my idea, is that we are now all being promoted to directors. So in the past, we have referred to each other as board members at this table. Staff has um, actually initiated, and, and the executive committee thought it was a good idea, that we actually start, we're directors. We are directors of this organization, and we're, for moving forward, we're going to try and, and refer to each other th in that way. So Director Rakowski versus Mayor Rakowski. I, I don't know if it's a promotion or not, ma Mayor, but, <laughs> but from now on, you will be director. So anyway, that's, that's the last really official act. But anyway, Elise, please go ahead. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to thank you for this, and I would read through some of it, but it's pretty hilarious. It um, is. <laughs> yes. It uh, is. Do not show anything to your friend that might affright him. Right. <laughs> it's, it's do a not touch your body in public. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> good rules. I think good, good words to live by, right? <laughs> yes, and I'll be sure and read this before I attempt to take over the helm. Okay? Yeah. And thanks for thinking of me. Always, always. All right. So the fun is over. We are now going to get the report of the executive director. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm consistent. Uh, okay. Well, first I'll, I'll just call attention to the handouts at your seat tonight. Uh, one is uh, about the annual awards dinner. This is your opportunity to um, sponsor a table. Be sure you're there. A lot of you have sent in um, uh, submittals for awards in your community, so you definitely want to participate in that. Um, if you are new to the board or if you uh, have a new alternate, please, uh, or even if you're not new and you just want a little refresher course, there is an orientation uh, here in this room on uh, the 25th at 4. Um, we are still beefing up that program. Uh, you, you will recall that in December you adopted a new uh, board onboarding or capacity building program and that's we're still working on that now that you've approved it but uh, this will be slightly different than what you've seen in the past but not the full-blown new uh, orientation that uh, that you'll see uh, in the coming months uh, there's a MetroVision idea exchange uh, on um, preparing Colorado for a re resilient future that's on February 24th from 9.30 to noon, that's this other blue and white handout. And there is a new, because we continue to have some um, uh, uh, changes on the board membership, the at a glance document uh, is a newly updated uh, listing of uh, members of the, of the board. Um, I will try not to take a whole lot of time here because uh, we're already running a little bit late. Yeah. Um, so let me just see what I, let me just kind of skip through here and see what I really need to tell you about. Um, you all should have received something called a benefits and value document last month, talking about what your jurisdiction has received uh, in the way of uh, funding or other opportunities and benefits from Dr. Cog. If you have any questions or concerns or would like to talk about that more, I'd be happy to do that. Or if you didn't get it, uh, please let me know. Um, I wanted to mention too that next door we had um, a, um, a program uh, called Searching for a Home. It was about homelessness in Colorado and this was 
uh, part of a partnership that we have with History Colorado, and uh, we did a program over there that had been uh, deferred, actually, because of snow a few weeks ago, but when we actually held the program a couple of weeks ago, we had more than 200 people attending. This was about homelessness and seniors and the crisis that we're facing right now, so it was really great to have that many people interested in understanding uh, that we do have a serious situation going on in the region and, and how we might deal with that going forward. Um, uh, Jayla and I both appeared on um, KEZW's show No Copay Radio. Um, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about the um, appointment that I received from the governor last year to the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging. This is a group that's putting together an action plan on how we deal with this incredible um, uh, demographic shift in the aging population here in Colorado. And then Jayla talked uh, about the Older Americans Act that Jackie mentioned um, was the topic of our DC uh, visit last week. Um, even though AARP is not always our friend, uh, I would mention that they have actually um, uh, recognize that we do do a lot of great things here at Dr. Cog, and they, uh, AARP National Headquarters is interested in convening uh, regional planning organizations like Dr. Cog who are working uh, on age-friendly initiatives. They had asked us to contact uh, some of our national peers to see if we could find some other uh, major metropolitan areas that would be interested in, in participating in this cohort, sharing ideas, and, and helping uh, uh, create something that other communities could uh, replicate going forward. So we've um, got great uh, participation so far. Uh, Boston, Sacramento, Albany, Kansas City, Phoenix, Atlanta have all expressed interest in, in participating in this. And this is all because um, uh, Brad Calvert on our staff and I have made contacts out there in the community and, and gotten folks to agree to come in and, and participate in this. And um, I think we pretty much covered uh, the trip to um, uh, the trip to D.C. But as soon as we get this package together, we will send you a copy of it. And if you'd like additional copies because you have a trip planned to Washington or you're going to talk to our members, uh, we'd be happy to share that with you. Um, if you have contacts, and I know that there, um, I don't know about currently, but I know that there are former board members who uh, worked uh, in Congress uh, as staff. Uh, different points in time. If you still have contacts, uh, especially in a, in a state that's colored red on this map, if you have peers that you're close to in other MPOs or COGS that are red on this map, um, if, um, if you don't want to talk to them personally about it because you don't feel you know enough about it to have a conversation, but um, if you would make an introduction for me, I would be thrilled to be able to do that because um, uh, this is really important for Colorado. So I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We're now going to move on to public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated at this time for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of this meeting. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. I'm looking for public comment. Seeing none, I'm going to close the period for public comment. We will move on to the consent agenda. I'll look for a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Wonderful. OK, the action agenda. Item number nine, discussion of election of officers and administrative committee members. Attachment C in your packet. I'm not sure who the representative is that's going to speak to this from the nominating committee. Is, is there a, oh, mayor. So, director. director, see, that's why I said it. You have to catch, you have to catch me. Uh, do we move for unanimous consent of $5 fine for the chair? No, <laughs> no. Wait a minute, out of order. No. Uh, very briefly, uh, we had a, uh, wide representation of uh, people on the committee. And having seen uh, what the previous uh, vice chair, treasurer, and secretary did, we thought they should all move up. The tough part was selecting the new person on the block. And we, after 
discussion we thought and inspiration that Bob Pfeiffer was the person to add to the executive committee. And then the um, administrative nominations, so there are 18 slots on the administrative committee, 16 of which are spoken for by population or status, county, et cetera, and, uh, or, and 15, excuse me, and then three uh, ad hoc people, and those were spread out among, uh, uh, again, geographically and size-wise. So with that, uh, the committee strongly recommends adoption by the entire group of directors uh, as proposed. Motion to, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, before we vote, I do have to ask if there are any nominations from the floor. And no, Bob, you can't nominate someone else. <laughs> okay, seeing none, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Unanimous. Congratulations to our new officers. And condolences to Bob. Members buying drinks afterwards, right? Right. Of course. <laughs> Second. At the Brown. Oh, um, At the Brown. At the Brown. Yeah, we're gonna and we're gonna put. The brown bottle, yeah, that's right. And we are going to put these new officers right to work. Uh, action agenda item number ten: discussion of changes to the committee structure. It's attachment D in your packet. I am going to be turning this over to our new chair, Elise Jones, who is going to be discussing the um, the potential changes. Um, thank you, Jackie. And. To clarify, uh, we decided that Jackie deserved to run a full meeting in her last uh, day as chair. So, but I make it quick, people. <laughs> <laughs> so we can all buy her a drink. <laughs> yeah. So the governance committee has been meeting for I don't know. Feels like forever. It must have been at least 18 months. But the exciting part is that we've done a whole lot of good work, and you're now seeing our recommendations come forward. Devoted recently on turning the MVIC into a study session. And tonight we have before you some really important proposals around changing the committee structure. And um, Bob gave you sort of a preview at the last board meeting. I'm going to go into it in a little more detail. And I wanted to make sure that um, to set the context and to um, be clear about what quote unquote problem we were trying to solve by even delving into this. And we were really trying to accomplish, one, I think, uh, three important things. One, we really want to increase board engagement in the organization, both the number of board members that can be engaged in, on, in, on committees and also the depth of that engagement. Uh, we, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were increasing the efficiency of this organization so that we weren't ever meeting just for meeting's sake and the meetings that we did that we do hold really have a purpose and we wanted to increase our oversight over the organization in particular I think as Jackie mentioned our fiduciary oversight of the budget and really take a deeper dive on those uh, issues than we do currently so those are really the the three goals that we are trying to accomplish through examining our current committee structures and proposing changes so I would encourage you to turn to attachment D and I'm just going to run through the, the really important pieces of it. The first thing we did was we have board officers now that function like an executive committee but we have never formalized that. So we propose formalizing an executive committee that really articulates what the, exists now in terms of the board officers functions. Um, that's laid out there. One of the things we wanted to clarify because it seems like there's some mystery about what the board officers actually do when they get together and meet. And we do meet before every board meeting and uh, MVIC meeting. Uh, we don't have any policy making authority. Really we're focused on helping set the meeting agendas, helping facilitate uh, conflict resolution if there's any conflicts, um, talking about process like how do we actually move through Metro Vision and getting um, updates from these new committees that we're going to form. So that's, that's what the board officers would do as a part of the newly articulated executive committee. Uh, the big proposal though really lies with taking the existing administrative committee, splitting it in half and have two important committees that really delve deeply in their uh, issue areas. So the first one would be the finance and budget committee 
again, taking a deep dive, looking at the budget, receiving financial updates, reviewing the audit when it comes in, and reviewing and approving contracts. These are things that the admin committee does now, but on a rather superficial level. So um, this committee would, at would um, really, again, take a deeper dive on the, the monetary pieces. We suggest that the Dr. Cog treasurer chair this committee. One of the benefits of the new committee structure I, I should have added before is it allows for better leadership development of the board officers as they work their way up to the uh, chairperson role. And so uh, we're going to have the board officers chairing these committees, and I think that's important to note. The committee would be populated. We took the admin, the, the, how the admin committee membership is currently designated, and which, as, as you may recall, are, are the board officers, the large communities with populations over 120,000, and three additional members nominated by the board. We took that and we added um, an additional two members that the board would nominate, so there'd be five smaller towns that would be added um, to this committee, similar to the, the second committee as well. Again, increasing the number of board members that are deep, more deeply engaged in the organization. Uh, obviously, we would need to, to stagger the first year. W one of the proposed changes is to have uh, committee members serve for two years to really get a little bit uh, more continuity of oversight of the organization. The first year, we would have to stagger with, with half of the, the terms being for one year. So that's the budget committee. The second half of the admin committee would be the performance and engagement committee. And this would take on the really important task of doing the annual evaluation of the executive director. We also added to it the, uh, the important role of engaging new members and onboarding and planning the annual board retreat. We neglected to put on the list, but selecting the annual awardees for the, the annual award dinner. And this board, uh, this, this uh, committee would meet at least quarterly to get um, updates from uh, the executive director on the action she's taking in response to the uh, annual evaluation and would really focus on those performance and engagement issues. The Dr. Cog secretary would be the chair of this committee under the proposal. And the membership would be chosen identical to the uh, budget committee. Sorry, the same process. So the, the pool of the admin committee would basically be split in half, and then we would add additional members. And I will get to in a moment how we decide to, how the splitting occurs. So the last page really has to do with the nominating committee. We wanted to uh, recognize very explicitly the important role that the nominate, nominating committee plays in, in establishing the leadership of this organization. So it's very important. We, we, uh, and we've done a good job, I think, with choosing that, but it needs to be a balanced, thoughtful, experienced committee. So we wanted to tweak how uh, the membership of the nominating committee works. Uh, I think it was by the, the soon-to-be past chair suggested, gee, the past chair should be uh, a standing seat on the nominating committee because they have the longest tenure in terms of being a part of board leadership and what, what it really takes. Um, another sitting seat was, is proposed for the city of Denver. And this is helpful to get some context. If you back up, one of the reasons, probably the primary reason we embarked on this whole governance uh, process was uh, because the city of Denver raised some issues about how we could improve and how we should recognize the role of the capital city um, in Dr. Cog. And the thought was, okay, how do we um, provide, provide, recognize the important role that they play, um, but balance it out? And it was thought that the nominating committee having a seat on that so that they would be a part of choosing future leadership made, made good sense. And then the remaining four members, one would be chosen by the Performance and Evaluation Committee, one would be chosen by the, the Budget and Finance Committee, one would be by the full board, and the remaining seat would be by the chair. So cha a slight change in, how, in who sits on the nominating committee. And the nominating committee would be tasked with um, splitting up the 
current admin committee in betwe between the performance committee and the budget committee. The first time out, well, if that makes sense, we would survey committee members on their preference on which committee they'd like to sit on, and then the nominating committee would, would take that information and balance it out. Um, it should be noted that the first time we s established this nominating committee, we would establish an ad hoc committee that where the board would add, would um, add the two seats. Sorry, this is a little confusing. The performance committee and the budget committee don't exist yet, so they can't nominate people to the nominating committee for the first one. So the board, the first time around, will take on the job of nominating those seats. So sorry if that was a little bit muddy. It's complicated. We've spent a lot of time with this. What we are asking tonight is conceptual approval of this committee structure. If indeed you all approve that, then we will ask council to draft the necessary changes to the articles of incorporation, which may involve a few tweaking of words to make sure we set it up exactly legally. Also, and this, again, if you approve this tonight, we'll, we'll ask the council to do this uh, draft of the articles and we will vote on them uh, at the March meeting. We will also, at the March meeting, create the ad hoc nominating committee, which means if you are interested in serving on the nominating committee, um, be thinking about that and make sure you show up to the board meeting because we will be voting on that, that committee membership in March. Um, also at that time, we will, we will uh, solicit people for their interest in filling in the extra seats on the performance committee and the budget committee. And um, the new nominating committee will then meet and try to establish their recommendations for committee membership, which then we will vote on in April. So we would vote on the new committee appointments in April, and then in May, all of the new committees would be official and meet for the first time. So moved. <laughs> so let me stop there again. I know that was a little bit complicated and see what questions there are before we, um, before you all discuss whether or not this sounds like a good idea. And I should add, Bob, if there's anything I missed, feel free to jump in. No, you, you did a great job, Lise. Um, it is a complicated uh, uh, effort here, and there's been a lot of healthy debates from one side to the other, and I think this was a good landing spot um, for us. And what I get excited about is the board engagement and allowing more individuals to participate in groups that affect the overall organization. I mean, we're, we're literally going from 15 members to 30 to be on these committees. And then also, I think it's appropriate that we have the, the oversight uh, over the budget and the performance of this organization. The admin committee was, honestly, I, I sit on it, I think it's a little stretched thin to have all those hats and now we can put folks that, like Phil who loves numbers or, you know, or uh, uh, Mr. Rozier over here, Director Rozier, I guess is what I'm saying, but who likes numbers and, and they can sit on those committees. So that will give us the proper oversight into those committees. So. Lisa did a great job, and we can clarify. And and I have to apologize. I was supposed to provide a timeline in here, and apparently I didn't get it here on time. So <laughs> I apologize. Director Rakowski has a question. Uh, real quick, uh, hypo hypothetical director Randy Jones from Mayberry. Uh, I'm not sure what county uh, would only serve on one committee. Could not be on both. I thought that was the case, but I thought I should clarify it. Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Director Partridge. <laughs> well, wow. I'm trying. I'm trying. We have to get used to that, don't we? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's probably some discussion about uh, City and County of Denver having multiple seats. Could you share with us a discussion and some of the uh, the analysis of that and reasoning? So just to be clear, currently um, Denver has two seats now on the admin committee, and we would be splitting them, uh, one for the performance and evaluation committee, one to the budget committee. Um, the new addition really would be having a, a standing seat on the nominating committee. And did you want to add to that? Yeah. Okay. No, no, I mean... Uh, um, Director Partridge, um, <laughs> I, I've been on the nominating committee twice, and uh, City and County of Denver has has had a participant in in that committee since 
since I've been here. So it's it's almost procedural because you know I've I've dealt with uh, um, former director Nevitt and um, director Kanish was was on the last one. So to me, it's just a formalized of of what has already been happening in in place. And, and I would concur with that because I also sat on the nominating committee for two times prior to my uh, being on the executive committee and. The same held true. There was always, since I've been around here, there's always been a representative of Denver that sat on the nominating committee. Please. So I hear that, that that's been the, the history, but I still have not heard a, a an analysis and a reasoning why that is. And that's what I'd like to see, to hear. Uh, certainly, if uh, since they have two on admin, and as to is that because they pay two fees, that that helps explain it. But to be an automatic seat on the nominating committee you know I, I challenge we have city and county of Broomfield so uh, you know so I'd like to know the reasoning because I I think that's all we're all about is the the equal and when we we certainly have large cities small cities large counties smaller counties but um, I'd like to hear a reasoning just for a discussion purposes director treasurer Pfeiffer how's that how it goes um, the, so let me give you the context of the conversation, and then I'll look to my peers to, to weigh in. But the conversation was Denver had a concern that um, you know they do pay a lot of dues here, and they, they are impacted by the decisions we make here, and they felt that there was uh, uh, an importance for their role uh, in the direction and leadership of the organization. You know, I don't think they can go through the, the ranks, right? I think Denver is restricted from going through the ranks. No, they, they, they are able. They're eligible. They're able. Mm -hmm. So that was the context of the the discussion, and um, you remember this all speared from a conversation that started this whole structure and governance committee, which was, you know, making sure the dues were fair and there's equal uh, representation and so forth. And so when we were diving into it, the discussion around it came that Denver felt that it was important enough that they had some uh, say in future leadership here, based on their financial contribution and the impacts to the capital city. Director Rogier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and if I can say, Director Pfeiffer, uh, I understand what you're saying, but if you look at that with the number of participants that they have around this board, and it states specifically in here, city and county of Denver will have one representative on each committee. You look at the population on which they serve, you split that, split that out three times. Um, they're over represented com as compared to what about Arapahoe County uh, what about Jefferson County um, and actually they have more representation than than other counties or cities out there and um, if all it takes is to complain I'll complain that Jefferson County doesn't have enough representation um, on this board and I don't I I'm trying to see the the reason for a change and the problem because I view this as less representation because we're splitting this out and now Jefferson County instead of being able to have the full experience on the admin board we only get a little piece of it over here now so for my constituents it's less representation Shakti director Shakti I just want to give a little background for people who might not have been following this. Um, so the city in Denver is a city and a county. Um, so they have the option of paying two de dues and having two seats. Um, just like, like I'm from Lakewood, so we pay dues and we have a seat, and Jefferson County pays dues and has a seat. So it's, so it's to be equal like that. Now, um, is it Broomfield is also city and county? Yeah. But I think they had the same option, but they've chosen to only pay one dues, so they have one seat. So that's the um, little background. Director Stoltzman, did I miss you? Did you have your hand up? I, I haven't put it up yet. But oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody whispered in my ear. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, yeah. But I, I actually have a different question so I think this is a good okay. conversation so we should stay on this topic okay are there any other comments regarding the, nom the, the nominating committee or not just the nominating committee but the placement of two Denver representatives on each of the committees are there, are there comments or thoughts you... okay uh, I have a clarification yes I just want to the, the 
the status quo is that, as Shakti pointed out, Denver has two people on the admin committee. And what we articulate here is they shouldn't be both on the budget or both on the performance, that they should split. Um, so in terms of changes to the status quo, that's not very different. Um, I think that the bigger question is a putting, institutionalizing in more formally the practice, which is that, doc, that Denver has a seat on the nominating committee, which has been our historic practice, but has not been in the articles. Director Rakowski. Any comments from Denver? Director um, Banganello. Yeah, thank you. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to participate directly on the governance uh, conversation, but clearly we've been talking about it um, through the other board directors and, and meetings that we have within the city. And I, I do think, I appreciate the comments that are here today. I think we are trying to make sure and, and interested in having a good regional representation that, that covers everybody. Um, Denver, as has been, has been mentioned, is the capital city. Um, and unlike the, the other counties, we don't have multiple cities to represent us. So I think when you think about the, the overall population of the counties and how they're represented here, while not the same, um, there is more representation at the counties from each of the, the cities that are invi invited to participate as well. So it, Denver really does value our participation and membership of, of Dr. Cog. We want to make sure that you know, everyone feels represented and, and fairly represented. Um, but I think everyone, from my understanding of the conversations that have gone on to date, the, the governance conversations have been, have been um, exciting um, and fun. I have not been there, but I hear that they have been, I think my sense is that they've been really well thought out. Um, and discussed, and that we've come to some really good discussion, to, to some good agreements about moving forward that Denver's feeling really comfortable with. Did you? So, um, I, I do think that it, it would be worthwhile hearing from the Denver representatives who participated on the committee. We are, we are asking, the, the structure and governance is asking for approval and concept of this. It, and I think it's the idea of splitting into the admin committee. So um, I do think we can make the decision regarding whether or not Denver splits and is, has a permanent seat on the nominating committee. We are not deciding that tonight. We're deciding the concept of splitting the ad, re creating these new committees. And, um, and uh, I guess I think there's some good points that have been brought up. I'm going to just put that out there that that, we're going, to put, we're going to park the Denver issue on, on this for right now, but we will be coming back to this before anything is formalized and before articles are changed in March. But I think I'm going to now entertain some other questions regarding this proposal, and I, I know Director Stoltzman was waiting to do that, so I'm going to have her speak first, and then Director Cernanek. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is about the Executive Committee. So I'm a little bit hesitant with the Executive Committee becoming an official public body. Uh, because, for one, we have listed the executive director as a member of the executive committee and as a public body, as a formal public body, anytime a group of three members of that body get together, they would have to notice it. And I'm very much in favor of transparency and open government, and it's very important to me, but I can also think of times where the chair and vice chair and the executive director might want to meet to talk about sensitive issues and not have it publicly noticed. So I think that that might be uh, something to continue to think about, listing the executive director as a member of the committee. Um, I, th I think there, there is a role of staff, and it's very important to maintain the balance between the board of directors and the staff so that we can have uh, sensitive conversations when we need to with our staff members. I also think we should continue to think about how meeting minutes will be taken at executive committee and how those will be publicly noticed, just to, just to be sure that we actually want to formalize that as a public body. Director Rakowski. Uh, to allay your concerns, generally in this type of operation, the executive director would be ex officio member, uh, much like a city manager would sit in with the mayor, mayor pro temp. So I think you'd really be able to have still two people get together without noticing it and still have the executive director there because that person is the elected, uh, your point on elected is very well taken, so that only the electeds are the ones that are being noticed, not staff. 
And before we move on, Director Cernanek, I want to fully explore this. If there are any other comments regarding this issue, um, and I guess um, I do think we need to give guidance to the structure and governance group, so I'm not sure what the feeling is of the rest of the body regarding, I think uh, Director Rakowski's explanation was comparable to what the executive director was whispering to me uh, in, in the, uh, <laughs> so um, let me get some sense of whether the body is comfortable with that and the executive committee being a, commit, a formal committee with the executive director acting as the ex officio of that. Okay, it looks like we are comfortable with that. So I am going to now move on to a new topic, uh, Director Cernanek. Uh, not necessarily a new topic. Okay. Uh, part of the reason for the approval and concept that's being sought at this point in time is, uh, as you might imagine, by the time you get to the charter components that need to be modified with this, it ends up being a substantial document for review. And rather than going through that drafting exercise without some agreement and concept uh, would be um, pretty dangerous task uh, and maybe a waste of time. So what you're hearing is an explanation of here's how it's going to go and um, some notes uh, certainly with regard ex officio membership. And um, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking to cut off the discussion, but I will restate so moved and see if we can at least get the motion on the table as well. I, I, I I think that's very point well taken, but we will be having discussion on this because that is the point of having it. So if there are questions, they are going to be asked tonight because to be able to respond, we need to hear from the body. So um, is there a second for the motion? Okay. All right. So now let's, is there any other discussion on issues regarding this proposal that, that the directors would like to bring up? Uh, well, I just want one clarification. I don't think it was the intention of the Governance Committee to require a formal agenda or minutes of the Executive Committee, that it would, it would still meet as is in the in, informal manner in which it does now. And so just to clarify that, obviously we need to make sure that Council reflects that accordingly. But and in terms of it being a op open, now I believe it is and nobody shows up and that's fine but the meetings are noticed so that would not be a change from now. And I would say that the executive committee meeting um, really is an agenda setting meeting for all intents and purposes. It is the setting of the agenda. Uh, there are times where we have met to discuss specific things about how most notably, how, you know, how, how we think it best to proceed moving through MetroVision with the body. But other than that, that, that's the only exception I can see to that. So are there any other questions or comments or, or concerns? Um, Director Pfeiffer? Well, you know, we are coming out of here, we are going to be giving some direction to council to draft some charter changes. So I'm, I'm, this is what I'm thinking. Because I think there's some open discussion around the Denver Nominating Committee it is not critical to move forward with the nominating committee in the future structure right away. We do need a nominating committee, which we've at least as clearly said would be appointed from the board, but the new structure doesn't have to happen until later. So we could table that and pr proceed with the rest of the structure. Because it, it doesn't have to be in effect. The new nominating committee would not have to be in effect till November of this year. I, I completely agree. My, my question, though, would be to table the Denver portion of it because we, are still, we would still want to find out if this body is okay with having one appointee from the finance budget, one appointee from the performance group, if they would choose to have the, the other components of that body. I mean, I guess that's the feedback that we, we would like to hear from you. Uh, from the budget and the uh, engagement? Right, because right now the nominating committee is populated very differently, so. Right, but the nominating committee that we're discussing with Denver to be sitting on it as a permanent seat is a future nominating committee, not the current or right. the one in March. So Correct. having, I, I the, just having don't the discussion on nominating in March or by March is not really necessary to move forward. That's with the rest we, of it. What I'm saying is why don't we pull the nominating committee out of the discussion so we can have an open discussion with the proper representation here. Okay. So could I make a friendly amendment to that? I don't know how many times we want to ask the council to draft potential articles of incorporation. 
so I'm wondering if we can approve in concept everything except for the Denver seat on the nominating committee, direct council to go ahead and draft changes, including that one, and then decide in March. If we decide in March to go forward, we'll have the articles there and or they'll be it. done. Or pull it. Or pull, or pull it. Yeah, okay. But that way we'll that. have flexibility of action. Right. And that okay. would be the proposal. Uh, director, I mean, I'm, not, I'm just so seeing Mayor Atchison. <laughs> <laughs> director Atchison. Well, you're going to be worn out by the end of the I night. Know. Uh, to the other members' comments, and this is the thing that we had uh, at the governance with council, is that this is a pretty lengthy piece that he has to go through, through all the bylaws, everything in corporation. Trying to get it through on the first pass is, is going to be a monumental task for him to get it done by the March meeting as it is. To have him potentially have to do it twice it, it, it is a little concerning. But to the other member's point, if we can get it before us so that we can at least look at what he is proposing for the incorporation rules and changes to the bylaws, if we decide to change something, at least we will have the benefit of having legal advice going through all this. And if we decide to pull something at the March meeting, we can pull it. But if we don't have it before us, we can't act on it, and then we're going to have the council going through it twice, which is very laborious and very expensive. I, I'm not ignoring you, Director Stranetic. I really would like to hear from some of the folks who have not participated in the, in the uh, Structure and Governance group, because we do know what, what that, those, is there anybody else that has a comment regarding this? Because, okay. I just wanted to react to Director Pfeiffer's comment about November. Um, my recollection, Bob, is that the nominating committee would also deal with vacancies that might occur. And so it's not really delaying it till November. It could be April. Uh, if we wanted to defer it at that point in time, but it's it's more that this would actually be a, a um, an semi-active body to be on call to be able to address those vacancies when they do occur. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second, and uh, Director Franganello. Yeah, I just want to I just want to reiterate, you know, that Denver is happy with the way this has come out. I think the discussions have been have been lively. Um, and instructive and we're trying to get to a, a good place um, but we're amenable to you know being flexible to uh, director Pfeiffer's suggestion if that's the right way to go understanding that the work for council is considerable so. okay are there any other comments so um, what the motion in the second was was to approve everything in concept right now um, I'm thinking that we want to amend, so, I think we want something in here that does speak to the concerns expressed regarding Denver's seat on, on all of these. I, I just think that that captures what I'm hearing from the body, um, but, but I don't know. So, um, so, so me, Phil, would you accept, Director Shernanik, would you accept a friendly amendment to approve in concept all pieces of the proposal with the exception of the Denver seat? Yes, and I'll speak for Director Roth. Oh, it was Director Roth? Okay. He, yeah, he seconded. He seconded. Okay. okay. All right. So that is, what we, that is the direction that we will be giving. Can I clarify? Yes, but please. we will direct council to move forward with drafting everything, and then we will officially vote on it at the next meeting. Can, can I ask for clarification? You said Denver yes. seat in all three committees? Just the no, nominee. Okay, committee. just want to make sure we're clear. Okay. Clear as mud. Uh, Director Shakti. Um, I don't know if this is sort of unnecessarily opening a can of worms, but I'm going to miss next month. So um, um, I think part of the thinking that needs to play into it in, in the multiple levels that we're looking at is it's not just dues, it's also voting. And so we vote um, by jurisdiction, which means that is one of the things we do as a body that benefits the smaller jurisdictions. And Denver is the biggest jurisdiction. So that's one of the background issues. Is that not true? Well, except that it's not a city and a county, right? 
So, so, and I'm not saying what that means the answer should be, but I do think there are real reasons to look at at Denver and the issues of fairness um, in terms of governance in general. So there's my two cents for the next meeting. <laughs> okay. We do have a motion and a second. Uh, does anyone need clarification on the motion? Then I will ask all those in favor to please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Okay. It, we're mo abstained? We're moving forward in concept. All right, and now we are going to move on to agenda item number 11, a discussion of the statement of understanding. Um, again, Jerry Siegel is out sick. We're going to have actually Bob Pfeiffer, Director Pfeiffer, from the Structure and Governments Group lead this off. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we took feedback from the other directors, and if you notice, it's dramatically less. And uh, we actually, from Director uh, Chrisman uh, edits, we actually took more words out, <laughs> if you noticed. Um, and I think Roger, or Director Partridge, excuse me, I'll get used to this director thing, um, his feedback as well. So uh, uh, Director Shakti did a great job even furthering uh, this document. I think this is a good compromise. I think this is where we wanted to land as a group. And it's really just, uh, if you go to attachment F and you read it there, it's just really making sure that we are transparent as well as uh, helping the new board members or directors kind of just be aware of what they're coming into. There, there's, there's some of the language that was of concern in the bottom, bottom paragraph. If you notice, there's no bottom paragraph anymore. Um, so it's just more of an acknowledgment. Um, I think we're, we're very happy where we went with this. Do any of the other directors would like to add? So we are seeking your approval to have this as the one of the onboarding uh, documents. So I would like to make a motion if there is no further questions. Sir, question? Question. Uh, actually, director become it's actually a comment. Um, I was one of the people that vote or voiced an opinion that I didn't like the um, Darkonian aspects of the other document. I find this one much more acceptable. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there, is there a second? And we will still have discussion after the second. Second. Okay. And then uh, I don't even know what to call you. Chair Jones. You. Um, I, I wanted to thank the people that provided feedback. Um, Director Partridge, Director Christman, Director Beacom. I th every, there was, a, I think, a healthy conversation, and I, the Governance Committee obviously took that to heart, and I, I feel that it's a much clearer document now. Um, so I want to thank you all for speaking up and, and helping us get to that place. I would also add that while the impetus for this was onboarding so that we could act use that to actively recruit the right people to the board, that they knew what they were getting into, that they'd be excited and they'd be prepared. But I also think it's a document that if we're going to ask new board members to sign, th that it feels a little bit imbalanced to say, well, you knew folks that just signed and showed up. You need to sign this, but we're not going to. So I, I would just, <laughs> I think it works a lot better if we're all willing to sign it together. I mean, it sends the right signal to the new folks that are joining the board. So I just wanted to clarify that director Rozier. thank you madam chair um question what happens if uh a new board member director refuses to sign uh there's a discussion of before about oaths and different things out here um if you're looking for signatures on this once again there's expectations but i personally would not sign this director shakti um, so uh, this, um, it's sort of acknowledging what things board members do generally, um, but to the underlying question, what if somebody doesn't sign it, then they don't sign it, life goes on, like nothing happens. Are there any other questions? Yes, Director Dozo. Who holds the document? Where does it get filed? Is it a piece of paper or is it electronic? The details of that have not been discussed by the committee. It's my understanding that the document would be held by the, the uh, 
much as the document that appoints members to the organization, it would be held with those, I'm assuming, with, the, with Dr. Cog's staff. So you may or may not know that actually a written letter is required to be the appointed member from your organization and also for the alternate. And it, it is a written document that is required to be held by the body. And I would, I would assume, unless I hear otherwise, that, that, would, that it would be the same. And, and I, I think Shakti's point, uh, Director Shakti's point uh, is well taken. We cannot force anyone, nor would we want to force anyone to sign this document. It is, it is kind of just a voluntary participation. Uh, so, but I think there was a follow-up. Yeah, the, yes, a follow-up. To me, it makes sense then to say that the letter appointing from the organization, uh, I mean, from the entity, like from the town of Superior, appointing me to be a member should include the acknowledgement that we acknowledge or I acknowledge as a member of this body yeah. that I will do these things or participate in this way. Instead of having me sign it, because I'm kind of like going, sign it? Where does it go? You know, paper the bathroom with it? I don't know. You know, so it's... It's, I think that it would be better to incorporate these statements in a kind of a, almost like a form letter or an attachment to the letter that comes from my entity saying that I now am a member of this organization and I have committed to do this instead of having me sign a, another piece of paper. Director Dyack. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was a part of the Structure and Governance Committee. Um, I, I think we did fantastic work at getting to this. I think um, uh, the bullet points here uh, accurately represent what, um, what we do. Um, I think, you know, my issue as, as I put in the uh, Structure and Governance Committee was the signature. Um, to me, I forwarded it to my council. Uh, my council said, don't sign it. Um, but again, I, I support what this is. Um, to me, my comments at the Structure and Governance Committee was um, if, if we create engagement, if we're doing the right things, um, and we, we set expectations such as this via uh, a slide that we see when we come in or when we go online to the portal, um, you know, this stuff is, is to be expected and really is, is an afterthought. Uh, so, I mean, to me, I think the mission was to kind of legitimize and create uh, a sense of importance of this appointment, which it, it is. And I think the direction that we're taking and trajectory um, is getting us to that point of, uh, of importance, hopefully, within all municipalities. So, I mean, to me, I don't see, I see the importance of the words, uh, but to me, um, I'm with Director Rogier, I, I can't sign this based off of my, my uh, town attorney. Are there, are there other comments or questions or concerns, or is there a, a response from uh, Director Pfeiffer? Would, 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 because would the word voluntary in the title help this matter? Because I, when I run for an election, I have voluntary documents and code of ethics I can sign or not sign, and it's in every packet. And this letter you're referring to that you get from my city, I've never seen that letter, yet it's filed in my HR director. Or HR file here, whatever it is. <laughs> no, but it was from your community to Dr. Yeah, Kyle. yeah but I never saw the letter. Right. So right. I'm afraid if we put this attached to a letter that I never saw, then I really didn't see it. The point of the signature is just saying, hey, did you know this is what you're getting into? And uh, I didn't know it till after I was appointed and I met um, our executive director for lunch. What, what does this entail? I mean, I've always heard the rumors, but, you know. <laughs> So all this is saying is, hey, did you take the moment to understand what you're getting into before you get into it? And that's all it's asking for. So, you know, there was some discussion that the, the city or town clerk or whoever uh, administers your paper present this, you know, when you're looking at doing it. Um, maybe the word voluntary statement of understanding by members. I mean, does that help some of this concern? Because it's not just saying you acknowledge the tasks that you'll be asked. Any thoughts? I see this Director, one. Director Dozel. I got a big book when I asked to be on this group. And I asked. As soon as I got elected, it was like the night after election, we decided who was going to be on what committees. And I said the only group I wanted to be on was Dr. Cog. Mm -hmm. Nobody else really understood what Dr. Cog was. 
but I did. I've been in Denver a long time. I knew what this body did. I got these notebooks. Mm -hmm. I got two or three of them. I went to orientation. I, I don't know why we need a single piece of paper in addition to everything else we get when we become new members or new directors of this august body. And I just think this is like, what are we going to do with this piece of paper? I include it in, incorporate it in somewhere. Help get the phone call maybe from the executive director, from the chair, to say to that person, you recognize the importance of your agreement to be participate, participatory in this organization. So I just think it's something that, it's great. I don't have a problem with the words. I just don't know what we're going to do with another piece of paper that somebody thinks we should sign. And I kind of have the same problem as the others have said. I don't think I could sign it. Uh, not that I wouldn't want to, but I just would be advised not to sign it. Because it's, it's a useless piece of paper, a, a sign when I'm talking about that, a signature on a document. It's not necessary to have it incorporated into the other things that are already part of the on onboarding process. And hopefully as people come to this, to these meetings, they'll recognize how important it is to participate. Thank you. Uh, Director uh, Chair Jones. Uh, so I think that, that the impetus for this were really twofold for how this document could be used. One, when Jennifer is going out to jurisdictions before they make the determination on who their Dr. Cog representative is, and she's trying to educate them on what's entailed, what are the expectations, what are the opportunities that that piece of paper can be a part of. And we ask new, new board members to sign this to understand here's, here's what's involved. So before, you happen to know what was entailed with Dr. Cog, but a lot of folks aren't aware of that when they get elected and they're divvying up the, the responsibilities. And so you, you want to make sure that people understand the importance, the time commitment, um, the opportunities there, and I think having them look at and sign that paper, or look at that paper ahead of time provides that opportunity. And then also, once you are, um, you're actually appointed to Dr. Cog, to sort of, and I think it was um, Director Fiverr talked about, you know, getting on urban drainage and, you know, getting sworn in the gravitas of recognizing the importance of sitting at this regional table and, and feeling that as I am the Dr. Cog rep for my jurisdiction and what that tells and recognizing that that's not a, a decision that should have been taken lightly um, and that it's, it's, um, it's a great opportunity for your community that you're, you're there. So I think it, that was really, there was those two purposes in having that document. So I'm, I'm going to make a comment. So unless there's somebody else that has not spoken yet that wants to John, you just have to wait. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, uh, so God bless you, Director Dozel, that you actually sat down and read this entire document. When I lifted it up, I was like, wow, I, I need to get back to the gym. Um, so I, I have no problem whatsoever with this included in onboarding as a voluntary thing, and I respect completely that some folks will consider it another piece of paper. I am one of those crazy folks that actually reads the papers that I sign, and before I put my signature on it, um, I uh, think about whether or not I'm going to do that. And to me, the act of putting my signature on something is significant. It is me kind of saying, to the best of my abilities, this is what I propose to do. Um, I, I would say we're spending far more time on this than I think is called for with this body. I think. Um, we can all choose to sign it or not sign it. I like the idea of an expectation when I come into an organization to say, I'm going to be a partner at the table and this is what, to the best of my efforts, I'm going to do. Um, I, I uh, don't want to cut off debate, but I think we are hashing and rehashing the same things. But I do want to make it clear, it's a voluntary document. There was no consequence if you choose not to sign it. I think the act of having read it at least makes some sense. So. I'm going to ask if there are any other comments or if anyone wants to proceed to potentially a vote after Director Dyack speaks. Um, I, I guess my comment was I, I just think we're trying too hard on this one. Um, we, we've gone through, we've talked a lot, we've gone through different vari variations. Um, to me, if, if one doesn't sign it, it, it doesn't make sense for all to set an expectation to sign. Um, so, I mean, to me, I just think we're trying too hard. Okay. 
Oh, yes, Director Jefferson. You know, uh, I agree. I, you know, as a, as a relatively new member here, I, I don't see a ton of value if, if um, only half or less of the body signs this. And, you know, I, I guess I haven't been around long enough perhaps to see some of the, you know, lack of sincerity from some of the new members. You know, certainly as a new member myself, you know, when I get involved with something, I'm certainly um, trying to uh, meet the expectations of that body. And so, again, I don't see a huge need for it. And again, I guess I'm just concerned that if, if not everybody signs it, it loses that luster. And so I, I would be supportive of just not having it and just including it in the packet as a basic advisement to new members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Director uh, Bagel, Daigle, Daigle. I actually was just going to say, if you wanted to hear from somebody new, I don't mind signing the piece of paper. It's like me giving a promise that I'm going to be here and that I'm going to be committed. And when I got the thing, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to read this book. And I did. And then I went to the website and went, there's 171 more pages I need to read just for the agenda. Wow. Okay. But to me, you sign it, you don't sign it. But I do agree that you should have some pomp and circumstance because it, when you're sworn into city council or whatever, you know, wherever you, you've come from, you have a ceremony and that ceremony is important and it kind of brings it home that, you know, this is important. This is important to my community. This is important to my family. This is an important kind of thing. And it kind of adds to that commitment level, I think. It, if it's just another committee that you're sitting on, and and actually that's kind of maybe how it felt at first was, wow, okay, I've been appointed to yet another committee. And then I got the book and I'm like, oh, wow, oh, now I get what this is. Um, so maybe there is some room for a little bit of pomp. I mean, you know, we don't have to have a parade down Broadway, but that would be cool, too. Well, win the Super Bowl and we'll do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, maybe a swearing in or a something. I, I think it would be important so that new people coming in feel that, wow, this is an important job and it's important to my community and it's important to my constituents because that's really what we're here for, right? And I think that truly captured the intent of what the Structure and Governance Group was working towards. Um, recognize, yeah, oh, Director Jay. I wanted to be called Director Jay. That was really why I raised you my hand. You got it. <laughs> you, I could call you DJ, actually. <laughs> and, and you know, I practically faint every time I read the packet, knowing that there's that much to, to read. Uh, I do support this, this document because, for me, it's a reminder of, of why I'm here. Uh, I hope that everybody would sign it. I think it's, it should be voluntary. And I, I think of the fact there's nobody that's really with a gun saying, did you do this? Or there's no, uh, you know, anything goes wrong if you, if you didn't all the things you signed. So I, I really support it, and I think it's a great idea. Okay. All right. I don't see any other hands. There was a motion and a second. I'm going to ask for a, a show of hands with this vote. Um, all those in favor of including the um, statement of understanding by members of the board of directors as part of the onboarding and, and the opportunity for existing members to sign it as well. Please raise your hands. The, uh, uh, Director Pfeiffer. Since I have the motion, do we Excuse want to me? clarify that there's a voluntary statement, use that word in the front? No? Okay, leave it as is. All right. Okay. All right, all those in favor, raise your hand, please. All of those opposed, please raise your hand. Hi. The motion passes by, by two votes. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with that slim margin, to be honest. I, I, I don't think we're where we need to be with this document. Uh, um, I'm not sure what the process is to, to handle that. I don't think a two-person majority to ask to sign on to this makes a lot of sense for the organization. I really don't. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, I think it would be up to the structure, structure governance to ask to, to take, take a look at this. Or frankly, I think we might just let this sleeping dog lie, folks. Um, 
Yes. <laughs> it passed. Yes. The motion passed. I understand that. But I, 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 you know, the purpose of this, guys, it wasn't, it's not requiring anybody to do anything. If we voluntarily can't agree that this makes sense to include an onboarding with a, with a stronger majority, I don't think we're sending the right message. And I'm just speaking as the chair. I'm not telling anyone that what's going to happen. That's my opinion on this. Well, Pardon? Nothing? No. Yes, Director Jay. DJ. I, it's worth it. Um, could we just include it without having it be signed? Include the language um, with the, could, uh, all right, uh, I think that's a worthy suggestion uh, included in the packet and not not being signed, which I think was communicated earlier, but I, I, but I don't know how we unwind well, what we just did. Right, so. we, well, because the structure committee probably should go back and look at what the chair and maybe some of the others, because I agree we should have a more unified discussion around this. Um, why don't we take it back? I, I still didn't get what the major issue was other than signing it. D well, do we I, need, I mean, is it the I, signature you know, part? I, in the interest I of time sure we, for, for this organization and moving on in the agenda, um, I want to, I do think we, we're not going to move forward th with this and I have no problem having structure and governance go well, back. Hold on, it's so, passed. So, right, so that's, so that's my question. That was where I was going. Well, so, but, but I don't want to go waste the governance time hashing exactly. out when I don't have clarif clarifying direction from the folks the that body. were not in favor of it. So I think it is worthy to spend a few minutes. So we make sure that we use our time wisely when we group for two hours uh, in a few weeks. So, you know, uh, if, if it's just a signature, then let us have the debate over the signature. If that's really it, then that's all we need to just debate. Is, is that, I'm trying to look to some of the folks that were against it. Can, can I take a straw poll if people would be willing to include the document as part of the onboarding without a signature? If you would do that, this is a straw poll, it doesn't mean anything, raise your, I mean, we're not, just get a sense of, if, so right, so to give the structure and governance direction, if you're, if it's included as a document in the, in the onboarding packet without a signature, are folks comfortable with that? If you are, please raise your hand so we can get a sense of the room. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing yes, so I think the structure and governance has their marching orders, uh, but we do need to deal with the process of what we just voted on. Director Atchison. All right, here's what I'd like to propose. I'd like to recall agenda item number 11 and ask that that item be tabled until a date to be determined after structure and governance goes back and reworks this. That is the only way I see that you can undo the vote you just did. Because you have a passed motion, you have a vote that was positive to the recommendation of the motion. So I'm asking to have a motion presented to recall that item back and then have it tabled. Second. Motion is second. Director Shakti. If all we're going to do is take off the signature, I don't understand what the structure and governance group is going to do. And as a member of that group, I'm kind of tired of it. <laughs> so, so since I, so I want to make sure we follow the right order. Is it recall? Are you sure it's recall? I have to recall it. Or reconsider. 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 Reconsider or recall. I, I have to bring it back to the table because it's already been passed. So I have to pull it back. So the prevailing side wins. Right. So, so that, would, mayor, that would mean I would have to make the, wouldn't it? No. Anybody no, who anybody. voted in the affirmative okay. asked for it to be recalled. And I voted. And so you made the motion. It was seconded. All, uh, uh, but I think we need to clarify the motion. Put your mic on. Mm -hmm. Can we have a friendly amendment to your motion to reconsider? I, I don't care. I'm just trying to get us beyond where we're at now because we're getting nowhere. <laughs> now we're stuck. And we, and we have I think you have to re reconsider it and then we got to vote on it no. again. So two steps, right? I think it's two steps. So the first thing we're going to vote on is to <laughs> reconsider Stupid action item, agenda item, agenda item item 11, discussion of the statement of understanding. That was, there, was a, there was a motion. Is there a second on that? All those in favor of reconsidering, we're going to do it too, reconsidering the discussion of the statement of understanding, raise your hand. Okay. I think it passed. No. Opposed? Okay. Let's at least. Right, so you've got it back. And now we're going to have. Discussion. No, I, I was going to suggest. I'm going to make a motion that we. Um, adopt item 11 without a signature. Second. All those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. 
Opposed? We, no, we got one opposed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for working through this. And thank you to the structure and governance for work and uh, also for uh, the Director Chrisman, who spent a fair amount of time on this, not being on the structure and governance. <laughs> All right, we are moving on to a discussion of the 2016-2021 TIP review white paper. It is in your packet agenda, excuse me, uh, attachment F, Doug Rex, our Director of Transportation Planning. We got you all, we got them all warmed up for you, Doug. Not Mike, Mike. <laughs> We're not a friendly crowd. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the time for this today. Um, well, I, I was going to do a collective exhale uh, for, for the whole work group because uh, it's been a whirlwind for us with regards to this document. You will, will recall back in August, um, the board directed the formation of a, of a tip review work group um, to begin to explore uh, you know some of the process and and that that was involved in the in the uh, selection of projects as part of our our, our 2016 to 2021 tip and the and the part of the, part of the concept would be to explore some of the criteria that that would that was used in in that call um, as well as begin and explore what other MPOs are doing and uh, with the sole intent and purpose that a future board would have this information at their disposal. At, at such time that they begin their uh, deliberations with regards to what the next TIP uh, policy should look like. So with that said, um, we did form a work group and uh, we have for your, uh, for your consideration this evening a, the, the, the TIP white paper. The work group itself was made up of, I miscounted, is actually 21, not 22, two members. Um, and many of them are with our are in the back of the room here this evening. I certainly appreciate them being here, and I truly do appreciate the level of effort um, from all those folks. Just raise your hand, those who are involved on, on the committee. There's more than that. Anyway, back there. And a uh, very modest bunch. Um, and we did, you know, I, I'm not real good with the new math, but I know, you know, uh, you know, from October 16th to February 3rd is 16 and a half, half weeks, and we met eight times. So that's about once every other week that we met. So we met. So it was it was a, quite a whirlwind for us. But I think we 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 were uh, um, we're happy with with the product. And I will say as we get into this that this is really you know this is really kind of a springboard you know for future discussion. This is not the end. It is information that we wanted to uh, we felt was important at this point in time to provide to the board for uh, for your consideration. So. Um, what I propose, Madam Chair, and if it pleases the committee, I would like to just walk through this, this, um, this report real quickly, because I know time is, time is short, um, and take questions as, as you see fit. Uh, just to clarify, would you uh, appreciate questions at the end or during the presentation? Any time. Okay. Feel free, folks. <laughs> okay. The white paper itself, table of contents, um, there's... There were seven distinct chapters, sections, uh, eight including the appendices. Um, the first was a very short section with regards to the federal requirements. Oh, we do have additional copies. Anybody who doesn't have a copy and would like to have one, we have 20 or so up here um, for anybody who would like to have it. So you can follow along in your program. Um, so, the, so basically the, this section was just to highlight what the, what the federal requirements are. And the thing I would like for you to take away from this, although there are federal requirements and we certainly have to follow those, the, the, there is quite a bit of flexibility in how a region can administer their TIP process, um, which is great news for all of us. And as you will see through, um, through the MPO comparative review that we've done, um, there's a lot of very different, different unique qualities and aspects that, that different regions around the country actually do. Um, the review of existing TIP process. We really had, uh, the work group was part of, of the review of the information that we had um, as part of their deliberations. Review comments that have been submitted uh, in three different, di three different ways. Um, the first was a TIP open form, and this is one that we traditionally always have as, after our, our TIP, tip uh, call for projects to just get feedback from, 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 uh, from technical staff 
about how they believe the process went. And um, so we, we did that in June of 2015, and then you'll recall in August when you decided to form this work group, um, we, we asked for your comments. We, and, we, and, and the third um, part of this was the work, work group itself took it upon themselves to actually do a survey of those, of those sponsors who did submit projects, or sorry, who were eligible to submit projects. Um, and all, all this information is within, within the appendices of, of, the, uh, of the white paper itself. The white paper is only 13, 14 pages long. It's intentionally streamlined. Um, and uh, so we, we hope it was an easy read. So with regards to we, it, within the report itself, we did try to summarize some of the key, key feedback that was received um, through, through those three, three opportunities. Um, there were some positive. I, I chuckle when I see this because, you know, I, we only shown three that were positive. There are actually more than that and a bunch that need further discussion, but I think that's probably par for the course with this stuff. But I think people really did appreciate the fact that we do this tip training. It helps not only those newbies um, who haven't done this process before, but those give a, uh, um, give, you know, re-educate those, those folks that have been involved in the process. Web-based call went really well. And the people seem to like the really the two-phased approach that we've been using, you know, for all of its, you know, the concerns that we've had with this process and, you know, and the reason we're looking at possibility, possibility of looking at other models. Um, people did like the fact that you know, the first phase was based primarily on objective criteria. The second phase, there was more discretion of the board to be able to, you know, um, you know, make things right maybe for in, with uh, in, in uh, communities that uh, or areas of the region that did not receive um, any projects in the first phase. So, needing further discussion, I won't go through these. Um, I will say, though, that I might just mention one. The first one there, the creation of the TIP Policy Development Work Group. Um, this is really a re reconstitution, a reinstitution of this this work group. Um, the last time around the TIP call, we did not have this work group, and what this work group was is a combination of both elected officials and technical staff. And they basically provided a recommendation to the board about what that TIP policy should be. Um, last time around, uh, the Metro Vision, Vision Issues Committee was responsible for the policy development. But they felt, this work group felt that this, um, that, um, you know, that was in a, that, that the process related to the work, to, to this development work group in, in the TIP called two times removed worked really well. Okay, other MPOs. Um, you know, as part of the research, we did do a comparative review. We looked at uh, uh, 12 different MPOs, most of which are our peers, some smaller, some larger, and we looked at a bunch of variables. And obviously, you can't read this. The, this, actual, this actually is within your, your packet um, on an 11 by 17 page, so you should be able to read this. And um, I would, you know, particularly like to point out Will, Will Soper and his staff. He's the one that that had the, the duty to, uh, to call these, all these MPOs, and there were multiple calls at times. So he was very patient and, and was able to get the information that the work group desired. Um, and I'll speak to this a little more here in a little bit. But really, you know, there was quite a bit of uniqueness ab amongst um, the various MPOs, but really, it really boiled down to really two very distinct models. Um, and one is kind of a similar model to what we have, which is a very centralized process in which member local governments submit their applications to the MPO and we, we decide on projects. The other is um, one th which had a kind of a combination between a regional and a sub-regional model. Um, very similar, and we make reference to it in, in the report to uh, how, how the Seattle MPO does it, and Chicago as well, where you have um, you know, you, you have two pots of funding, basically. You have a pot for regional, for regional projects, whatever, however that's defined, and then you have another pot of monies which is proportionately allocated to, to, to sub-regions um, for them to make some recommendations back to the full board um, as to how that money should be spent. But I'll talk about that here a little more in a second. So um, with all this information that the work group had, they really began to coalesce around five key issues. And, um, and I'll just step through those real quick. And the first, dealing with the incorporation of MetroVision. And we've had plenty of discussion through the last TIP call about what the role of MetroVision should be within the TIP process. Um, 
And so that is, you know, that is a key issue we've had. We have quite a bit of discussion about. And some of the, some of the concerns with the, um, uh, with, you know, with, with the whole measure, Metrovision measure was that there were some concerns that the, there was at maybe the current process, TIP process we have was not, didn't provide the flexibility for, for, for communities to be able to implement the tenants of Metrovision and still be respectful of their uh, local priorities. For example, you know, there could be situations in which um, a certain project type or a certain project investment might be ripe or the right fit for a specific part of our region where it might not be a specifically the right fit for a different part of the region. So the, we had a, quite a bit of discussion about that. Uh, I think everybody within the group certainly respected and believed Metrovision had a had a uh, important role in in the TIP process, but there uh, but there was um, some discussion about what level of flexibility was necessary. Um, geographic equity. There was no topic in our TIP process that got as much discussion as this one. Um, this was really this was a variable that was used within second phase. Um, it's been instituted now for I don't know three three four cycles, Steve. About that. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, you know, some of the concerns were, was that, you know, although you could, you know, we can fix the equity or include more variables, there's still going to be an issue. And some of the questions we raised were, well, does the current formula accurately reflect the, the primary user or benefit? Because the way we do it now is it's based on the equity within a county, right? So the contributions of that county. But, that if, but, if, but it's possible, of course, that you know there there are those there are other counties that would use that facility as much if not more than the people within that county so how do we accurately re reflect that within within the geographic equity equation um, you know we even talked if it, if it should be a, if it should be a factor at all um, and you know we'll talk about this a little more about you know would the sub regional allocation of the funds um, be more effective in order to uh, get to that true geographic equity um, small versus large communities. Um, you know, very small communities was a, was another variable that was used in second phase. So I think there's there's always been an an, a, an understanding that um, s small communities operate maybe at a disadvantage with regards to um, the selection of proce projects. So the question becomes, you know, can they can small communities really compete with the larger communities? Um, and you know there was the other side of that as well. Should we even be considering community size at all as part of our process? So we we had those discussions. Off the top programs and project funding. Um, you'll recall we've done this for for a long time now, Dr. Cog, um, at at the board's discretion. We set aside we set aside funds before we do the call for projects to uh, specific programs that um, that you see fit to to fund before the call, such as our way to go program, our carpooling program, or our um, um, our trans tra transportation demand management program, um, our traffic operations program, right? various air quality programs. Um, so we have that, and we also, um, you know, through the years have have done have also f have partially funded larger larger um, uh, you know regional projects. For example, in the last tip call, we funded. Um, a, a commitment to fast tracks as well as a uh, commitment to the I-70 East project. So there was questions about the, and maybe not a clear understanding of what the process was um, in, in, the, in setting aside money for either the programs or the regionally significant, significant projects that there should be a clear understanding of, uh, of how that process should work. And we, we talked about that in the recommendations as well. Multimodal projects, last but not least, um, I think there was a, a consensus that, you know, there needs to be a more holistic approach to how we select projects. Right now, um, we select projects based on project type. We have, you know, seven project types, I believe, roadway reconstruction, you know, capacity projects, operations, bicycle pedestrian, transit operations, transit services. So there's a number of those projects. And certainly, you know, the projects that score well do have multimodal elements to them, but they felt that, this whole, that, that the categories we have were, were still too rigid, and there were certain projects that just weren't not a very good fit. 
Um, I think of one in particular right now was, well, it's the Colfax project. It just didn't fit very well. And, uh, and so I think that's something that the, uh, that the uh, work group would like the, the board to consider in the future. Okay, this is the two regional models I talked about earlier. Um, you know, as part of this, you know, the comparison of the, of the MPOs, it really boiled down to two very unique models. And it was a regional model, like we currently have, versus a regional, sub-regional model, which is used in, in uh, various places, such as Seattle and Chicago. Uh, um, and so what, what the committee did, they, they went through this, this model comparison exercise. And what they tried to do, um, they tried to see how those models would address the key issues that I just talked about. You know, what are, the, what are the, the opportunities and the challenges with each of those models and how they address those key issues? So with Metrovision Incorporation, for example, the regional model appeared to be very well in providing, you know, a universal or a more evenly applied project selection process regarding Metrovision, you know, and I, I think that's probably true. But the, the problem is, is comparing similar projects in different parts of the region. Um, you know, I think I've always struggled with, and I think I've, I've even mentioned this to the board, is like, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, a bicycle project in, in Boulder, let's say, versus a sidewalk project in Douglas County, the needs may be different, you know, at any given time. And so it's very difficult to compare and contrast and make a decision on that. So um, that is one of, one of the concerns we've had. Yes, sir. Real quick, Doug, I note that on the dual model, you said it was Seattle and Chicago. I'll defer to my counterpart uh, from Cherry Hills on the geography of Seattle, but I think both of them are a little askew because there's a large body of water that plays <laughs> at both places, whereas here we have the capital city center and then things spread out. Right. And is, is that geography part of this or not? No, I don't think so, Mayor, Director. Um, <laughs> yeah, no doubt, eh? Now, uh, no, I don't, don't think it is. I mean, really, the way they do it with, with, in Seattle, and we can, you know, at a, at a future date, we can come back and talk about this in, uh, quite a bit. But they basically, they subdivide, their subregions are by county. Right, so they, they actually allocate monies to the counties and they create forums which every local community with on, within that county sits on and makes their project recommendations back to the full board. So, um, you know, we can see, you know, envision a similar type of arrangement. So, on, in the dual model with regards to Metrovision, it does certainly provide more flexibility. Um, you know, the project criteria could be fine-tuned at a more local level. Um, and I think that's what they really liked about this. And there, you know, there was some discussion about, you know, one of the challenges is that, you know, you don't, there has to be some meaningful oversight of the, of, of that, of that sub allocation selection process. You know, you don't, I mean, I'll say it, you don't want anybody to be game in the system, right? They want to be true, make, make sure that it's true and consistent with Metrovision. Um, geographic equity. Um, you know, we do believe that it's possible within the regional model, our current model, to fine-tune, um, maybe to depict the true users um, and fine-tune the formula that we currently use. But ultimately, it's still difficult to gauge true equity with this regard. I mean, it's just, it's always going to be an issue. Um, so I think, you know, going in, we have to, we have to know, know that and understand it. Is gauge spelled right? Yeah. Yes. Is it? Okay. It doesn't look right. Um, on the dual model, you know, by its very nature, um, you know, you're dealing with a smaller level of geography. So it, um, you know, it's possible, what we believe, you know, you can proportionally allocate that money to a, to a smaller level of geography. So it, 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 just by its very nature, it speaks more to equity than, than the regional model. The major challenge, of course, is going to be how do you distribute that money to the individual subregions? Um, you know, I think there will be, be plenty of meetings and long nights in, in deciding how that's done. Um, small versus large community. In the regional model itself, um, we could do a set aside for smaller communities, and there are, are indeed uh, several MPOs that do that. Um, and one of the challenges, we've, at least we talked about, is that, you know, if you do do a separate set aside for small communities, do they then also become eligible for the general call for projects? Um, in the dual model, um, you know, it was very interesting, our conversation, because, you know, what happens is, you know, because, you know, you're talking at a small level of geography, so 
you know, smaller communities are competing with a smaller pool of communities as well for that money, which is good, but you're also competing for fewer dollars, so it's not necessarily the best thing. But part of the discussion we had was this third, second bullet here that may encourage local partner funding opportunities, and I think that what that speaks to is the opportunity for more collaboration of a sub -regional, at a sub-regional level because you guys work with each other all the time. If you were to do it like at a county level, you were m familiar with each other and uh, could really work well in coming up with those projects which are, uh, truly provide the best benefit. Um, off the top programs, um, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot to say about this. In the regional model, it would be conducted the way that it is currently. Um, in the dual model, the, the off the top programs could be drawn from the regional allocation um, so it's not really much different than what it is now. In multimodal projects, there was no clear difference between the, uh, the regional or the, or the uh, dual model. Recommendations. Um, we did have five recommendations that we'd like you all to consider as we go forth. The first was the development of a project selection process purpose statement. Um, that's a lot of words to basically say that, you know, what we'd like is for each TIF cycle that we that the board really evaluate um, what the true purpose of this call is and it might be you know based on you know what um, the issues that well it would be based on what the issues of the time are and we even give an example within the white paper that you know first last mile for example first maybe first last mile would be an a a topic or a concept that the board would would provide priority to in a, in, in a given call, just for an example. This next one I haven't read because uh, this one we really feel strongly about that um, th and, and our hope is that you would allow the work group to continue its work to, uh, to look and explore in, in greater detail the, uh, the, this regional, sub-regional dual project selection model. Um, we, you know, we really just kind of just kind of scratch the surface on this. Um, we haven't found any fatal flaws, but we do believe a more comprehensive review is, is necessary um, in order for us to truly provide you back a, a, a recommendation. And I think we've got a couple questions, uh, Director Cernanek and then Director Atchison. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to the group that uh, worked on this. Um, have a few questions before we get too far down the road in uh, taking a look at, at the actions. Um, one is we, you know, certainly we've at least have talked about some separation between Metro Vision and the TIP process. And so, um, you know, one of the things that Metro Vision helps us in the regional planning is having some ideas of volume that right. might occur in the area. And so it helps in some of the modeling. Um, but what I wanted to do was, was ask uh, a couple of things. One is we had the consultant come in and um, we may not be proceeding with that but it brought up uh, some very interesting uh, uh, elements that um, instead of creating a lot of sub criteria mm -hmm. that we actually deal with system-wide goals uh, for example reduction in vehicle miles traveled moving vehicle miles traveled to transit um, congestion relief and improved safety and to use those those elements in project evaluation rather than some of our approach which gets us in the middle of the process right. and um, you know some thoughts on whether the group did that or you're talking about that in the next step and uh, before we get too far off um, was there any discussion about some of the impact or influence of map 21 which tends to deal with some of those potential system-wide goals or at least project evaluations against those kind of goals because um, you know we're all interested in less congestion, uh, maybe a bit more utilization of transit as we get to density in certain areas, and certainly air quality at some point in time, but it's a whole lot <laughs> diff more difficult to measure that by project yes. uh, right. than some of the others. Uh, but to use some of those, those, those basic elements and say, hey, here's what we're really about, and as opposed to some of these intermediate measures that sometimes cloud uh, are thinking and leads more towards, uh, at least in my opinion, manipulation. Yeah. No, I think that's very good. And, I, and quite frankly, I think that speaks to the first recommendation up there to some degree. That you know, I, we would like the board to coalesce around some very key, well, you know, develop that 
that problem statement about, you know, what are we trying to accomplish, right? I mean, is it, you know, safety obviously is one. I would suggest that congestion, mobility, all those things are, are, are items that, um, um, you know, the board might have an interest in us trying to solve. And we've talked about this a little bit with regards, and I think, you know, and I'm, I'm editorializing a little bit, sorry guys, with regards to, the, the guys, the, 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 these recommendations, but I think, you know, we even maybe even get to a point, like when projects are submitted, they do present a problem statement. I mean, what problem is it they're trying to solve with this project um, as it relates to the purpose and goals that the board has established? Um, and I do, I, I, I think, you know, I, I think the next call is going to be a lot different in that respect. I mean, I, I, I think we're, I hope. Can I, can I echo that? Yes. I <laughs> Mayor Atchison, I mean, Director Atchison. Let's see, that's about $15 so far. <laughs> we'll keep this I up. We're going to have a I beer fund before the night's out. I never agreed to the fines. I uh, never agreed to the yeah. fines. Uh, Doug, if the decision by the board is to go back for your second bullet, what I'd like to better understand is in the process of the regional, sub-regional process, when you look at some municipalities that cover the border of multiple counties, right, or also in the point where you have a city and county being only one entity. How do you deal with equity of giving a county that only has to support itself yeah. as well as how do you deal with the issue of some cities are in multiple counties? Right. I, l I don't know how you're going to deal with that, but I'd sure like to have a better understanding of what your thoughts are from the group on how they're going to propose dealing with that. No, that, I think that's fantastic. And, we, and, you know, within the document itself, we do, we do talk about, you know, some of the problems possible topics that we talk about and that is exactly one like how do you define that geographic boundary you know I, I mean what I mean that's a very good one with regards to cities you know being in multiple counties and you well, you, you know that very well um, there, there are a number of us that are that? yeah I mean that's very good um, and there is you know with regards to um, you know one county you know because we do have two counties like that right, right. where there's only one entity um, and there is you know there is within within Federal, federal regulation, it does talk about, you know, the, um, you know, basically you have to be careful with, with how you do that. Right. Um, we've had some cursory discussions with FHWA and how, how we handle that. But I think, to answer your question, I, I think that will be the key focus of the work group's work um, if you allow us to go forward. Director Shakti. Is it appropriate to make comments at this point? Or are we doing questions? I think it's appropriate to make comments. <laughs> okay. Um, so I appreciate all the work and the the recommendations all look good to me. Um, but then I have some concerns about the recommendation about the dual, what is it called? The dual. Dual model. Um, so it seems to me like the current system is that we, um, in phase one, we try and figure out which projects are best for the region and we fund those projects in order and we spend a whole lot of time and energy figuring out which projects are best for the region. Um, and um, then in phase two, um, we, and wh how much of the money is phase two? Um, 25%. 25%. Yeah. So then in phase two, we're, we say, well, we. We're not sure we got it all right, so we want to put some effort into making sure we have equity in terms of regional, um, sort of, uh, in terms of each jurisdiction and that kind of thing. Um, so this seems to me like the, the devil is, of course, in a lot of details that aren't there, but it has the potential to really pull us away from what is best for the region and towards okay, we're in this group together, we're going to divvy up every county gets their percent kind of thing. Um, and I sort of feel like my impulse might be to go in the opposite direction and instead look at how do we get the most impact um, in the region with this money? Like, this is what we have. Is there some way we can use it to leverage other money? Are there some big projects that we should really be focusing on those instead of... Um, so... Um, those are my concerns. Yeah. And, and if I could follow up on that, and, I, and then I'm going to move to Director uh, Dyack. I, I actually think it, it, what we do is we take 75% of the money, but we assign 
it to different pools. We decide how much we're going to spend on surf surface transportation, how much we're going to spend on bike ped. We put it in all of these buckets before we even look at what the big regional projects are that could make sense. So to me, that's where I'm concerned. We don't just do 75, 25. Of that 75, then we decide which transportation bucket we're going to put all of that money in without ever looking at the big picture of this regional community and saying, what is the big transportation fix that we need right now? So I, I completely agree with your comments, but I would say it needs to be backed up even more, which, you know, I, I don't like the idea of arbitrarily assigning percentages of money to go to each transportation project before we look holistically at the region. So Director Dyack, and then, and then direct, Director Henry after Director Dyack. All right. Um I, I'm excited at the dual uh, model. I mean, I think to me, um, it takes away those artificial um, percentages, I think, that we create to, to pigeonhole the money in. Um, I think if we start at the top where we have a big pool of money and we ask the question, uh, what projects are regionally significant or what set-asides, which we currently do at this point, that we want to fund, uh, and then we can find allocations uh, whatever answer that is down at the county level, again, local control, I believe if uh, the, 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 local, the more local the money gets, the better, the higher and best use of money um, we, can, we can put into use. Um, it encourages communication uh, with, within the county. Um, it brings us together in terms of planning, uh, not to mention communicating how should we best, uh, best allocate the funds if, if the uh, projects are... Uh, qualified by by tip so I mean th to me um, you know I believe every municipality here um, has a vision of, of adhering to to our metro vision and I know we have to divorce that but to me um, I want to get the hand the money into the hands of the people at the lowest level so we can make the best choices for our citizens and overall as long as we're adhering to the, the regional goals I think we'll be a better region for it so um, I'm excited to uh, to kind of pursue the dual model. Director Henry. I think we're getting lost in the weeds um, because all they want to do is to explore it further and to continue the work on what they're doing now. To worry about how we're going to, to come up with a formula or if we're going to do this, if we're not going to do this, I think we're spinning, spinning our wheels. Um, and I, by all means, support f uh, further ex exploring this. Um, I think it's intriguing. I think we need to, to definitely understand it more, and I actually support uh, further exploring. Thank you. Uh, Director Jones. Well, um, I, too, would support further exploration, although I do share um, a number of the concerns that Director Shakti and others have raised. Um, I, the part about the tip that has disturbed me the most is that there's no feedback mechanism to, to let us know if the projects performed how they were proposed to perform. So were our cr criteria the right ones and are we doing what's best for the region and the communities based on the things that we care about? There isn't any feedback mechanism and that it makes it hard. So we can talk about the process for dispersing the money but we don't know if we're getting the biggest bang for a buck or it, 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 if we're spending our money in the right way. So. Um, I, I would encourage us to continue exploration, but I think that um, some of those bigger issues uh, about in assuring regional benefit need to be included in in that exploration. Okay, great. Um, Please. Well, I, I just might mention Director Jones making the comment with regards to going back and looking at how those projects are performing. We we are we are attempting to do that more so now. We don't have a process really of bringing that back to you all yet, um, but it is something that we're evaluating all of our projects. Um, but you know, some were further along than others because um, you know we just recently come up with mechanisms to be able to track some of that. But we are doing more of that, just so you know. Um, Real quick, just we have five in total, so these, these are the last three. Um, you know, one, I think we've talked about this quite a bit, is to create a, a project selection process that places more emphasis on the project benefits, overall value and return on investment. And we we'll, might speak to this a little more in the, in the next agenda item, um, because I think it dovetails to some degree, um, but really use some quantifiable performance metrics. Actually, Jennifer forwarded me a, a, a a, uh, a story from earlier today where, uh, where Virginia is really 
getting into this um, quite a bit and, and um, really looking at project benefits and just taking, you know, taking as much as they can the subjectiveness of their selection out and uh, and um, and you know just trying to find those projects that provide the best return on investment. Explore opportunities to exchange CDOT state funds with Dr. Cog federal funds. This is something we've talked about for some time around this board about swapping those funds. Um, CDOT has an internal committee right now which are exploring this option and they, there is an expectation that they will have a pilot project or two um, within the next, within, by the end of the year. Hey Danny, can we say that or Deb? By the end of the year. Um, so th I think that's, that has a lot of promise. And last but not least, um, evaluation of the off-the-top programs and projects. On the program side, I don't think the committee is saying that there's, there's programs that, um, that are, are not beneficial, but I, they, they do believe there's, there's an opportunity here to really go back and make sure that the programs that we do have or the selection of, those, of the projects within those programs are providing the best benefit that, that, we, that, uh, that, um, um, that can be provided. And um, the other thing with regards to, you know, the, the large off-the-top regionally significant projects that we've funded in the past, to have a clear process in uh, deciding, you know, what kinds of projects should be funded, um, you know, if there, is there a maximum amount that those projects should be funded, you know, those types of things. Just having criteria so we can evaluate. With that... So I think we did ask a number of questions along the, the way here. Um, the staff is looking for a recommendation to move forward with the recommendations that they included in the presentation this evening. Are there any other additional questions, though, before? Yes, uh, Commissioner Henry. Do we have any kind of timeline on those recommendations? Well, I, I think I'd speak, you know, primarily to, um, to, to the one in red. I think that's the one that we would like to get going on is quicker maybe than the others. I think, you know, the others are, you know, are, are, are for the board's deliberation really I mean but this one is something that the work group itself can begin to explore more and provide that information greater information back to you all so I think as the work group our first our priority would be to begin this exploration director Rogier thank you madam chair Doug uh, the item here explore opportunities to exchange CDOT state funds with dr. Cobb federal funds yes I'd be really interested to hear what they say because um, the current CDOT director and the past CDOT director said that can't be done and uh, so I, I want to hear what they have to say because I've had many uh, conversations with them yeah and so if they come back with anything different that'll be interesting thank you okay. uh, yeah. I don't even know what to, are you a director too? I'm director. already a director, <laughs> not, so director I'm a director Smith. anyways. Um, so let me address that a little bit. I am on the working committee for that at CDOT with FHWA and um, there are a couple other states that do that. And I ha first of all, I want to commend you on this white paper. It was very clear, right to the point in terms of the issues. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Great job to the work group. Um, and I was just thinking, oh, you know, we're working through this issue in terms of swapping funds, and I was thinking, I hope it can be as clear as this was, <laughs> um, because it's a little muddy. So um, some other states do do that. We have some issues some other states don't have, and let me give you a for example, and we need the AG's opinion on a number of things. One is if we swap those funds, now they become, those state funds become revenue to the local jurisdiction. So if you're not debruced, that could cause some issues. So, you know, other states may not have that. The two states that we looked at that are already doing this. Um, the other thing is, based on our state legislation, in terms of what HUTF, which is the state funds, based on how it's defined in the legislation, it can only be spent on certain things. And we don't think it can be sent, spent on things that are like, um, um, like education type programs, TDM type stuff, that sort of thing. So you get limited. And those are the things we would love to say, let's swap them. Let's swap the funds. So there might be some issues there. So it's not as easy as being able to do it. So there might be a lot of constraints in order to get through our state legislation. Um, so we need the AG's interpretation on some things. Um, and just to give you a heads up to the states that we looked at, 
one of them being Kansas, they actually, um, when they do this swap, sometimes the state has, it's only for jurisdictions under a certain size, um, because they're the ones that aren't familiar with this. Uh, the other thing is um, they do a swap where it's like 90 cents on the dollar, meaning if you were going to get $10 of federal money, instead you're only getting 90 cents of state money. And that's because it's not going to require you as much to go through everything because you don't have to do um, Davis-Bacon Act and that sort of thing. And so it actually allows that state to spread the money um, a little bit more. And the, let me just give you one other reason. Um, some projects, some programs are very specific in terms of the feds, and we have to have, uh, have, to have a non-federal match, which is our state match. And we never, ever, ever, ever want to leave money on the table. And some states have gotten into the situation where they didn't have enough money from their state funds to match, and so they lost out on federal funds. And sometimes we actually are the recipients or we benefit from that because then there's a federal redistribution at the end of the year and we get a tiny bit more money. So we never ever want to leave money on the table. So we want to make sure that we don't go too far in terms of that type of program. So we're stepping through it carefully, you know, taking a look at some of these issues and I hope we can be as succinct and um, as clear as you were in terms of laying out the process here. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Director Fanganello. Um, I would just add that uh, ditto in terms of the work that you all did. Uh, thank you. It was really helpful and, and really well put together. We're supportive of all of the recommendations moving forward. I think it's, I think it's important for us to look at what's going to work best for he us here in, the, in this community. Uh, we're all facing growth and infrastructure challenges, but we're also facing different levels of infrastructure needs depending on where you are and how long you've been developing. So I think that if this gives us more flexibility, that that would be helpful. Director Atchison. Madam Chair, I would move to accept the 2016 through 2021 TIP review white paper and direct staff uh, to continue with the five recommendations they have and come back to the board once those recommendations are finalized. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Thank you. And I also, Doug, if you would please extend to the uh, working group how important their efforts are and how much it was appreciated. And I think the sentiments expressed by the directors here tonight should be conveyed. And it was really well thought out and presented. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, and you're not going anywhere because we're on to 13, attachment G. Discussion of participation in the Urban Sustainability Accelerator Program. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and I will be brief. Um, back in November, uh, Executive Director Schaffel, she, she uh, mentioned to the board that we, have been, we were approached by the Urban Sustainability Accelerator Program out of Portland State University. Um, in particular, Robert Liberty, who's, who's their director, had contacted us about the, the opportunity to participate in a, in a uh, cohort um, to begin to look at, uh, um, among other things, um, uh, regional investment decisions around transportation. Uh, it was obviously intriguing to us because the timeliness of it, uh, you know, as we were, we were, you know, deep in the discussions with the work paper and coming right off our last TIP call. Um, so we did have some interest in, in, uh, in hearing more details on that. So we invited um, uh, Mr. Liberty in and he held he held some, some work sessions with, uh, with uh, board members that were available to, to participate and just to get the reaction to, to what maybe some of the issues we've had with our TIP calls and how we'd like to improve that and just kind of brainstorm about the possibility of, of being involved with this process. So, um, so now, you know, what, so what, how it would work really is that we would, you know, if, we'd, if the board decided to pursue this, was that we would be involved with a co cohort of three to five uh, regions or, you know, around the country. And we do know that, um, that the, this, this urban, urban accelerator, I always get it wrong, urban sustainability accelerator program is, uh, is talking to um, um, Wasatch Front, which is uh, Salt Lake City, Sacramento, um, Charleston, South Carolina, as well as others. Of who would be part of this cohort and the opportunity to collaborate with other regions is uh, certainly appealing to staff if nothing else so um, so what we have proposed to staff uh, is you know if if you are so inclined that we would 
you know, uh, begin to have some more, more uh, comprehensive discussions with, with this group and Mr. Liberty and bring back for your consideration um, a, a, you know, defined responsibilities as well as a, uh, as a, a proposed scope for, for, for the work going forward. So just, that's it. Director Rakowski. Uh, real quick to the executive director. Given the full plate that uh, Mr. Rex and staff have already, will this require additional staff to take this on? No, I don't anticipate that it will. Um, in fact, the way, I mean, it, it will definitely be more work yeah. um, but uh, for staff, but I don't anticipate we'll need new staff. Um, I think, you know, reflecting back on the last, um, on the last item, the opportunity that, that, that may be here is that we do have better feedback mechanisms to understand what kinds of benefits we're getting out of uh, the projects that, uh, that we're funding um, and that we, you know, what, the, the challenge that we might present to the cohort to, to help us work through is how do we do better project selection to emphasize a project's value and the benefits and the return on investment that the board is getting. So, but yeah, it, it will definitely be more work and there will be um, 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 probably uh, three or four people in transportation planning operations that will be, that'll be coming into this uh, in and out depending on, you know, what, um, what problem we present to the cohort to help us solve. So I, I do have a comment regarding this. I, I do have concerns with the organization going down this path. Since my involvement as chair, I realized a number of things, how unique our community here is and how unique our regional transportation goals are. And when I look at the other organizations, Charleston, Sacramento, and Wasatch that may be potentially participating in this, I definitely see Dr. Cog bringing benefit to them. What I'm curious about is the benefit that they are actually going to bring to us. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's only $50,000, but I think it's a significant amount of staff time that is going to be involved in this effort, and I'm concerned that that time wouldn't be better spent actually focusing in on the issues that were just identified. It's part of that tip white paper, moving this community, this region forward. Um, you know, I, I am concerned with mission creep with this as we got, we, um, the, the uh, Council of Governments and MPOs are all unique organizations. Some of them are, have economic development responsibilities. Some of them have authorization to distribute CDBG monies um, there there and I, I guess what I'm concerned about is knowing that how 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 similar these other participants are to us and and I know they'll learn from us because I've been back hearing but what are we going to learn from that I'd, I'd like to have more understanding of the exact amount of staff time you think would be devoted to this and and really the the true value to this body Oh, yeah, Director um, I'm sorry. So I think those are really valid concerns. I actually was viewing this slightly differently that, and I'd love to get staff's reaction that this could be a segue um, from the really well done white paper and some of the project, the issues identified, talking with other cohorts about, um, you know, how do you measure the benefits? What's the feedback loop? Because I think there's commonalities on even though the jurisdictions are different, Measuring the benefits from a transportation project, that is probably a universal thing. And it w if there are other folks working on this, it would be nice to not to completely reinvent the, reinvent the wheel and get the best minds thinking on this. So I, I sort of thought that, that this project could be a nice segue from the review you all just did to actually sort of working with other regions on how they solve those same problems. Director Hutchinson. Yeah, the only thing staff is asking us for right now is right. to help develop a scope of work and responsibilities. They're not going to take action to actually initiate a contract, but if we don't understand what it is that we're really asking them to do, how do we make a decision? Right. Uh, and we aren't committing any dollars. All we're saying is bring us back a proposal of a scope of work and roles and responsibilities of what you're going to produce. 
And that's what this body is. That's what I, my, the intention of my comments were, and that's what we're looking for from the body. D Director Henry. The only concerns I have in regards to this is the fact that there was a very small portion of what I was reading that actually brought out our rural communities, and there was absolutely no mention of suburban communities. Um, so if we do decide to move down this, this road, I would really would like to make sure that we highlight our suburban areas and our rural areas a little more than just our urban areas. Director Partridge. Madam Chair, I certainly uh, appreciate what was brought forward. <coughs> Excuse me. But I have my concerns too, and I just would like, to, I, I think you echoed my concerns very well. But I would like to ask you and, and Jennifer, on your trip back to D.C., uh, I certainly think we've all been involved with our like-minded cohorts that there's much sharing of information and I would just ask you do you believe you probably gathered as much information or more in your trip back and certainly with the respect that Jennifer has amongst the the field do you believe there was actually in your mind more information shared in your trip well, the trip wasn't focused on this, um, Director Partridge, but I will say I, I have, in the work that this organization has done on the Sustainable Communities Initiative, we've gone out and met with other MPOs and COGS. And, and you know, I would love it if there was a magic bullet out there that provided these feedback mechanisms. I, everyone is, at, at least it's been my experience, everyone wants to know what Dr. Cog is doing because they see us as a model. And that I don't see. I, I was out um, with the Wasatch group. We met there. Um, there were folks from Seattle. There were folks from Kansas. There were folks from Texas. I can't tell you which community. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and they're, they're all struggling with these same issues. And I guess my concern is I think we're bet I'd rather spend the 50000 on a local consultant that can come in and work us with us, work us through these issues, much to Director Henry's comments. These are the things that are important to us. How are we bringing in the suburban communities? How are we dealing with it? So I'm, it's not saying that we're, we wouldn't learn something from these other folks, but with the time and expense, that's my question, is that why would we be better spent there than us doing it for ourselves? That's, that's my, my comment. And so and I'll let the ED respond to your question also. Well, I would, I would say that I would echo what Jackie said, that that wasn't the purpose of, and, and the focus of, um, of our visit back to D.C. We currently uh, aren't members of, um, of the National Association of Regional Councils. That was a conference that we attended uh, in addition to doing the Hill visits. Um, and certainly there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and information that, that goes um, on there. but. It's not, um, it, it's much more high level discussions about um, uh, federal transportation policy or rulemaking or those sorts of things rather than kind of getting into the nitty gritty about, well, how do you go about measuring whether or not a project uh, that you funded is really bringing the value or is actually doing what uh, uh, it was sold uh, that it was going to uh, do once it was implemented. Um, so I think there are different ways to get peer-to-peer -peer, um, input. This is this is one conferences, uh, memberships, or or another. But that certainly wasn't the the purpose of the trip that we were on this last time. Uh, Director Fanganello. Thanks. Uh, I agree with some of the c comments that have already been made. I think if we're going to put together a scope of work, we need to make sure it reflects our local context, to your point, Director Henry. I also think that um, my experience is that it's actually really helpful to have outsiders sometimes come and look in. Um, there is a lot of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, sort of people are enamored with Denver and the Denver region generally, I think, right now. And I think that, you know, there's a lot to say for folks around the table here and folks that have been here before us for why that is so, but I also think it's important for us to always be forward thinking and forward looking for how do we make sure that we stay on the cutting edge and progressive and people are coming to look for us and to us. And I think sometimes that's difficult for us to do by ourselves without some outside voices. De Denver right now is participating in um, it's a Daniel Rose Center fellowship and there are four other cities that um, are in there with us, Long Beach, 
um, Birmingham and Rochester, New York, and I think we had some of the same conversations as, oh, what are those cities going to bring to us? They, you know, we'll bring something to them. But uh, in my experience, I was in Long Beach all week last week. The, it, it's not just about the cities that are participating, but the panel members and the, and the staff that they bring to this conversation that are experts in the field. We had the opportunity to bring, sort of shine light on things for the city of Long Beach that they hadn't been thinking about. So I do think that these types of opportunities might shine light on things that we might just miss because we're a little too close to them. So I would recommend that we move forward. Okay, are there any other kind of comments to, or things we would like additional information? It's my understanding this is going to come back to us at the next, um, next month to make a decision. And, and so is there any other additional information folks would like to see next month? Um, they need a motion yeah. to come to next month. Uh, so I guess I would, if we do, I'm seeing a nod from staff to make a motion that they, they flesh out a scope of work and then bring that back to the board? Yeah, I think we'd like to have your direction. Yeah, second. All those, in, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'm being a loser. I'm opposing. <laughs> oh, OK. Opposed? Please raise your hands high so people can see. And so and then I would also like to recommend that everyone please read this in your packet. Um, this is a further definition of what is potentially going to be going on. And come prepared next month. OK. Uh, now we're moving on to legislation. The easy stuff. And they all have lots of no, you're not on. Did you lose Excuse me? So uh, we are in we are discussion of state legislative issues, attachment H, bills on which yes. positions have previously been taken. I'm ready. Uh, so in the interest of time, though, I'll, I won't go into much detail on this one. Um, if there's questions on specific bills, certainly can answer them. <clears throat> I'll just say that so far um, all of the bills that we supported last month um, are still alive and most of them are moving through the process. Uh, one, the one bill that we opposed, Senate Bill 11, the one that would have taken the uh, faster fees for transit and eliminated them, that was PI'd in committee today. So that, that bill is, is gone. Wait, 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 wait. Um, like so if there, if there are not any, yes. Just Rick, uh, just for a reminder for the board, uh, we did take a position on uh, House Bill 161008, mm. which was a support of the bus on shoulder. Yeah. Uh, and I did receive concurrence from the board last month to testify on behalf of that since I'm doing it for some other groups. And I will be testifying for the same position that the board authorized last month tomorrow at committee. Thank you. All right, we are in the interest of time, folks, so, so I'm going to try and keep us moving. Director Cernanek? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, uh, Representative Conti indicated that there has been a fiscal note on 1065. Yes. And uh, it's significant. It's significant. Again, less as it was last year. Right. Uh, but she's saying it's not. It's, it's not as significant as it was last year. <laughs> it's still pretty significant. It passed out of a finance committee and is sitting in appropriations, so they certainly won't do anything with it, at least until after they uh, introduce the long bill. So. Okay. All right. So the, on the list of new bills, um, I'll, I'll take them one by one, but um, hopefully Atta we can move. Attachment I, folks. Just yes. Keep up. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, Rich. No problem. Um, so the first one, um, House Bill 1161, is um, at just asking to monitor it at this point. It's a bill that um, allocates or takes some of the leftover money from the, old, from the senior property tax exemption that gets transferred to the older Coloradans fund and takes 5% of that money and, and actually allocates it to disabled veterans and the rationale for doing that is the what we often call the senior property tax exemption is actually the senior and disabled veterans property tax exemption and so joint budget committee decided that um, since at least small part of that is uh, money 
or exemption goes to veterans that it, the less, at least a portion of the leftover money ought to also go to veterans. Um, so we just, as a staff, we're just recommending that we monitor that bill to make sure they don't try to take more of it. <laughs> okay. Move to support staff recommendation. Is there, is there was a move to support staff recommendation. Do I have a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay. Thank you. And, and the other, the next bill, 1175, that I'm also recommend we, we monitor just to make sure uh, nothing negative happens with it. But uh, this one is a legislative audit committee bill uh, where they turned up some evidence, I guess, that uh, there are folks out there who are claiming the this property tax exemption and getting it that don't necessarily qualify. They might have used to qualify, but they don't anymore. And for some reason, they're kind of slipping through the cracks. And so this bill is an audit committee recommendation to kind of clean up that eligibility determination so the state's not paying out more than it's supposed to be. So I'd recommend monitor on that one. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Thank you. All right. The next one on the uh, on the second page, I'm going to ask your or no, I'm not there yet. Okay. So that one is support with amendment, and the amendment that the issue on this one is um, apparently nursing homes and assisted living residences had always gotten exempt or sales tax exemption for their food purchases, and what apparently they're saying that. Um, a new staff member in, DO, in the Department of Revenue has re reinterpreted the statute to say that no, in fact, they are not exempt. And so they want, they're wanting to go into the statute to clarify the previous practice that their food purchases are exempt. Um, when I read the bill, I thought it read a little bit broadly because I think you know that under the current sales tax, our purchases of snacks or food for immediate consumption is not exempt. And it doesn't look like they're they're you know taking care of that limitation in this bill. So we've worked asked the the sponsors about amending the bill, and they've said that they've already gotten comments from others on that same uh, issue. So I want to recommend that if uh, they amend the bill, that then we can <laughs> uh, support it. So moved. This question, Shakti. So this this affects state revenue or. City yes, revenue? it would be for just for the state sales tax revenue. Just yes, it is revenue. just for the state. There's a motion, and is there another question? Yeah, Rick, I know that in our municipality that is sales tax in there because it's part of the food plan, not part of their care. Exactly. So it is connected as a municipal sales tax as well. Okay. Um, my understanding is that the way the bill's written, it it only is addressing the state sales tax, but I will definitely make it clear or make sure that it's not dealing with yeah, anything that, to do with the that, local. Yeah, then because we can end the, uh, I'm not sure I'll how they're going to sure. handle that because it is collected at two different levels, both the state and municipal. Okay. I don't think the county gets involved in it, but uh, I know we do as a municipality. Yeah. Okay. We'll make sure that it doesn't address the local. There, there is not a second for the motion. Oh, there was a motion. All right, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay. Um, the next bill, uh, 1242, um, is actually moved through the House and most of the Senate. It's, a, uh, it's the Department of Human Services Supplemental Appropriation, and it includes the uh, $1.5 million of that excess senior property tax exemption monies. That'll be going to AAAs like Dr. Cog, so we're asking you to support that bill. Thank you for finding it, Rich. So moved. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Um, all, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Okay, we are moving on. Okay. Think, oh, I'm sorry, Rich. For a little bit of a, uh, just a, I realized that um, I'm going to pass out another bill that you already know about, so I don't think I'm violating here. The, because of timing, the uh, Senate Joint Memorial that we mentioned at the January board meeting didn't actually get 
uh, introduced in time to be in this packet, but it deals with the issue that you discussed earlier today about um, um, the trip back to D.C. This is uh, the uh, Senate Joint Memorial where the uh, state legislature is, is uh, memorializing Congress to uh, pass the Older Americans Act reauthorization that eliminates that hold harmless provision. Um, and um, so we, we were able to get uh, bipartisan sponsorship on the bill. It's calendared for, uh, would it be next Tuesday, I think it is, uh, February 22nd. And uh, we're going to be uh, sending out. Is, is this the legislature taking a supportive position? Yes. The congressional de delegation? Yes. Yes. So we would uh, ask to add that to the list and ask for support on that memorial. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Great. Uh, All right. Transportation bills. Um, I'm going to add, there are a couple on here that I'm going to ask you guys to tell us what you want us to do here. So the first one is um, a bill that it, it looks to me that it's kind of interesting in that the first part of the bill looks to me like it is changing the uh, way the Senate Bill 28, 228 tra uh, transportation uh, transfers are allocated to make sure that regardless of these various caveats with Tabor and how it might be cut in, at different times, that a full, a full five years of full funding will take place at, um, regardless of how long it might take for them. Uh, so even if they got cut or, or eliminated in one year, we would at some point um, get the full funding. Uh, the second section, though, is more problematic, I think, uh, for the board, and that is that it removes the requirement that uh, of the funding uh, for transit, and it basically just makes it permissive that a jurisdiction could use the the, the funding. I think it's it's in the, in the bill. It's 10% um, for transit, um, and, or you could, uh, or jurisdiction could decide to just use it on roads. And so I thought that one might be a little bit more problematic for you. And I don't know, um, Deborah, if you see that, taking a look at it. Are you referring to Bill 11? No, that I'm, I'm referring to um, 1138. So I don't have a position on that okay. yet. Okay. Okay. Well, Commissioner, I mean, Director Partridge and then Director Jones. $20, and then, and by the way. What? Twenty, wasn't it? Twenty dollars, by the way. You said oh, darn it! <laughs> if I correct myself, I don't know it. All this right. Is, this is going to be fun. We're going to yeah, have a big I, drinking party. I hope you all are enjoying yourselves. <laughs> Rich, uh, a notice is sent to the House State Veterans and Military Affairs. You expect this is just a kill committee mm -hmm. for this bill? It's probably a reasonable assumption. Director Jones. Well, I was just going to say it does appear like it's headed for. Um, its demise if it's at in house state affairs so I would either suggest we don't bother taking a, a position or I do have significant problems with the transit piece of it yeah we um, could just so. monitor it in case it s somehow stays alive so we could take bring it back so okay the know. motion to monitor second, second. all those in favor aye, aye. motion okay. up, opposed abstained okay thank you Okay, the next bill is 1169 is the one that um, makes the um, membership of the two uh, Ute tribes on the stack that are currently non-voting but makes those voting members of stack. And um, it's passed out of committee already, is on, on, is on the floor. I believe CDOT's supporting it and, and a number of others are. So staff is recommending we support that. Move that we support. Any, dis uh, any discussion? Sorry, it just happened quickly. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay. No, I like fast. You know what? I was startled by the by the speed and pace. So the and the, so the last one I wanted to ask your direction on is um, this. Uh, I guess everybody's calling it the transponder bill. Uh, which, uh, again, also I believe is in committee tomorrow. 
Uh, this is the one that First would up on the agenda tomorrow. Pardon me. Pardon? First up at yeah. That's tomorrow. what I thought. Is, yeah. Um, that and this is the one that basically uh, prohibits, I guess, is CDOT from using the transponders on the HOV lanes or on the express toll lanes. Director Rakowski. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Deb, but this is a million dollar hit to CDOT. More than that. In turn, well, at yeah. least, uh, because it's already in process and it, in effect would require CDOT to buy everything back. Uh, it's, uh, well, I think it's an ill conceived bill, and I'd strongly recommend we uh, uh, oppose. oppose. Yeah. Uh, Director Atchison. Yeah, in, in the support of what uh, Director Rakowski says, if this were to go through, we have no way to pay the tolls. We have no way to collect it other than license plate, which sure. means you would pay the premium for everything, regardless of whether you have the fee that you would be HOV or not. It just basically does away with HOV. It also ties everything up as where the managed lane is there to help us move traffic. This will not help us move traffic. We have a contractual obligation to plenary through CDOT right now to maintain this road for the next 50 years, Deborah. So you guys are all doing such a great job. <laughs> I don't, you can have my job. <laughs> but, you know, for, for us on the 36 corridor especially, you know, we've been working a lot of years to get this roadway built. Now, if we take away the funding for the repayment of the loans, how the heck are we going to pay the bill? Director. Tom Hayden Clickery, absolutely opposed. Is Just, that a motion? That is a motion. I move to oppose this. This is, this is, yeah, I, no discussion. Motion and second. <laughs> is there a comment? Uh, Director Stoltzman. Yeah, I just want to explain why I'll be voting the opposite way of everyone. I understand the financial side of this completely, but because there's a financial side that says that we're forcing people to pay to do HOV, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to carpool, but it's very challenging. We're trying to get people to use other modes of transportation other than single occupancy vehicle. And I think this is particularly, the, the, I understand the implementation, I understand financially why it was done, but I think it's particularly harsh on poorer people and people who don't have credit cards and access to um, this kind of system. You have to have a credit card for the transponder. It's, it's really not fair to everyone in the region. And it, we are charging people to carpool. And I think that's just fundamentally wrong. So I won't be voting the way everyone else is tonight. Any other comments? Okay. I'll, oh. We need a second to the motion. There was a second. <laughs> I'll second the motion. There's a second over there. All those. <laughs> all those. <laughs> All of those in favor of the motion to oppose, say aye. 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 Opposed? Two. Uh, were you opposing? No. I All right. Can we just have the count for who's opposing right now? Okay. And then, <laughs> and then, pardon, and abstains. Abstains. We've got two abstentions. Uh, and now, uh, before, I, I, before I call on you, Director Agitson, I'm going to ask Director Partridge if he wanted to make a comment. Thank you. Okay, Director Agitson. Um, since this is on the floor for a testimony tomorrow morning, this is the first transportation bill up, does the board want to present a position on this bill tomorrow morning? If so, do you want it on a, on a post, as you have just voted for? If not, I'm going to be there for the bill no matter what. I am more than happy to testify in opposition to the bill only if the board approves it. But I've got to be there anyway. Director uh, Rakowski. I move to ask uh, Director Atchison to testify against it on behalf of Dr. Cog, and that will take a two-thirds majority, correct? Second. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Yeah. Is there any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, raise your hand, please. Okay, all those opposed, raise your hand. Abstain abstentions, please, two. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Mayor Atchison. I can say Mayor Atchison in this reference. Okay. <laughs> um, is, that, is there anything else? Do I, do I have to negotiate my fee now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to want some of mine, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. 
All right, we are Thank moving you. on. Thank you. We are moving on to our informational briefings. The committee reports. I am going to request that they be brief and reflect the decisions made and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. Uh, I'm going to start with our incoming, our new chair, Elise Jones, for the stack. And that's Director Jones to yeah, everyone else. I thought chair was better. But. No, wow, that's fine. Anyway, I'll be quick. Uh, the Freight Advisory Council continues to meet. They're trying to come up with some quick wins, like allowing hazmats to move through Eisenhower Tunnel now that there's fire suppression. So they may be coming up with some proposals. Um, the stack had a very detailed um, description of the FAST bill, the Federal Transportation Bill. Ron uh, Papsdorf gave it, and if anybody wants um, a detailed handout, I could provide that. It was very helpful. Um, CDOT reported on their 10-year development plan um, containing like 100 projects totaling $8 billion. So they're looking to prioritize projects and, and develop a smaller list. Dr. Cog will have to figure out what that means for us because we don't really prioritize projects. And then we got a forecasting on Senate Bill 228 funds. Uh, forecast is that $200 million will flow in a fiscal year 2015-16 and about 100 the following year and zero after that. All of this year's funds, roadway funds, $180 million will go to the I-70 viaduct. And then last but not least, there's a grant program, the Federal Lands Access Grant Program. Applications are due May 21st. They have $16 million available, so communities that have uh, want to create access to federal lands should apply, and, and they have to be high-use recreation sites, but it could be shoulders, um, different paving, trails, transit. So look into that if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, Director Noon from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. At our meeting, um, we did a number of legislative updates, as we just did here. Um, and certainly the ones that we're following. And then we also had an update on CML's work on the simplified sales tax uh, group that they have. Um, we also um, had a presentation on statewide transportation polling that was done by the Colorado Contractors Association. And it had some interesting um, outcomes of that. And I think they're going to be pursuing possible uh, perhaps ballot initiatives. I think everyone needs to get their pens ready. It's going to be a long ballot this November. Um, and then one other thing that we um, formed, and it was at um, Mayor Wachowski and, and um, Mayor Christman certainly led the charge. We now have a public safety committee to look at uh, Metro Mayors. We have a homelessness. We have a, a water committee. And we're looking at transportation, of course. And then um, we have a um, this committee for public safety specifically to look at the increasing number of drug overdoses and so forth that are happening in our communities and there's been a number of articles in the Denver Post and so forth but Mayor Wachowski has been championing this and now we have a committee and they just met. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director Noon. Now um, the Metro Area County Commissioners, uh, Director Regier has left the building. Is there another County Commissioner who would like to stand? See Seeing none, evidently those county commissioners don't do much. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. We mainly had an organizational meeting I, where we set the agenda for the full year. Our next meeting will be with okay. Don Hunt and the Colorado contractors to find out what's happening with metro area transportation okay. funding. R properly reprimanded. All right, moving on. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, no, no, there's no five bucks. I said director. The report of the... From the Area Advisory Committee on Aging, I, I, think, I think Jayla is not here, and I think we've spent a significant amount of time talking about that effort. So I'm going to move on to the RAC, um, and uh, I'm going to just let you know that the, the three subcommittees of the RAC, the Station Area Sources, Mobile Source Fuels, and Transportation Land Use uh, Committees continue to meet to look at uh, the development of the state implementation plan for um, for our for our state because we are not in compliance with the 2008 standard. And they also approved a contract for the Ozone Aware Outreach and Education. Um, that is the money that we give them. So uh, Executive Director was very involved in reviewing those uh, potential contra contractors. So moving on to uh, the report on the E-470 Authority, uh, Director Rakowski. Uh, very quickly, there's been an ascendancy in the east, the star of Parker. <laughs> has gone to the top because the new chair of E-470's board is 
a former member of this board, Josh Martin. It also was historic in that it was his first meeting. It was also the first meeting of the new executive director, Tim Stewart, a former uh, a executive director of the Oklahoma uh, Turnpike uh, Commission and mentor of Doug Rex. <laughs> and the numbers were great in terms of money. Go for 70. All right, uh, fast tracks. Uh, director Van Meter. The board took one action related to fast tracks this month, and that was to change the Fast Tracks Citizens Advisory Committee's charter to expand it from just focusing on fast tracks to focusing on agency-wide issues as well as fast tracks. The board also heard an update on the North Metro Operations and Maintenance, as well as a preview of the service plans for the B and G lines, that's the Northwest Rail Line to Westminster, as well as the Arvada, um, the, the G Line, the Gold Line to Arvada and Wheat Ridge, the service plans, which are will be coming back to the RTD board for formal adoption next month. That's it from Fast Tracks World. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to look to attachment J and K in the packets for additional information. And again, it's been an honor and privilege serving as the chair of the organization. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>